Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's second meeting in 2019. Could I ask you please to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? We are going to move on to agenda item two, which is budget scrutiny. Uh, this is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2019-10 with two Government Cabinet Secretaries in two separate sessions. The first panel uh, this morning, I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, Andrew Watson, the Deputy Director for Agricultural Policy Implementation, David Blair, Head of Budget Challenge, Graham Hutton, the Head of ARE Finance, Kirstine Beddows, Branch Head, CAP, GM Policy and Agriculture Climate Change. That's quite a long title there. And Joe O'Hara, the Head of Forestry Commission Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, um, would you like to make a brief opening statement of up to three minutes, please? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. This uh, is a challenging budget. First, UK austerity. Second, loss of EU funding. And I would add to that the potentially cataclysmic and catastrophic impact on the rural economy were there to be a Brexit no deal. And I cannot emphasise that risk enough. Uh, Convener, in short, we seek a sustainable and a prosperous rural Scotland. The rural economy budget reflects the removal of transport and connectivity during the year. On a like-for-like -like basis, the budget is essentially flat in cash terms, dropping by 0.9 million, 0.2% uh, or 2% in real terms. I'll briefly outline some key choices. This £580 million budget aims to provide financial security and certainty to Scotland's farmers and crofters by delivering the CAP and to ensure that farmers receive payments promptly. I remain committed to the Rural Development Programme, including continued support for agri-environment, farm advice, crofting and the food and drink sector. I have committed to maintaining payments at the maximum level permitted for the less favoured area support scheme. I am not prepared to see levels of support drop below 80 per cent. We are working to stabilise and simplify financial support policies for farming food production after EU exit. Turning to rural services, my priorities include delivering world-class science support to protect Scotland from plant disease, spending £23 million on animal welfare and statutory vet services, uh, investing over £6.5 million in our world-class food and drink sector, and in a food and drink export plan to build on the growth in that sector. The rural economy budget supports Scotland's marine and coastal communities. We will maximise the benefits of EMFF to support key projects. Will protect Scottish interests in the negotiation of fishing opportunities and build on the strengths of our aquaculture sector, adding value to many significant investments in remote rural areas. The rural budget provides substantial support to rural businesses and social enterprises to generate inclusive economic growth. Providing over 74 million of funding to our rural enterprise bodies, which of course includes supporting the South of Scotland Economic Partnership and the new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland. We are investing nearly 59 million in forestry priorities, expanding woodland creation, delivering benefits for the economy, people and the environment. We will introduce new arrangements for management of forestry in Scotland under the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Act 18 and stimulate and enable woodland creation across Scotland to achieve our targets. Convener, this is a good settlement for the rural economy. It is fair and realistic through efficiencies, the natural end of some projects and substantial income generation from timber sales, I can meet my commitments to rural communities and act collegiately with my Cabinet colleagues to support wider Scottish Government priorities. I am confident in the choices I have made and that these will deliver for our rural communities and happy to take questions along with my officials today. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The uh, first question will be from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Oh, yes, sorry. Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me, Deputy Commissioner. I should, before we go into the questions, just remind uh, members that if there are any declarations of interest, that we should make them before we ask the Cabinet Secretary. So I will start off by declaring that I have an interest in a farming partnership as declared in my register of interest. I Wintman. would uh, likewise like to declare an interest as a member of a farming partnership as well. Stuart. Um, primarily because I'm not asking questions on rural today or expecting to, I, I declare for the second session I'm uh, president 
Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, Honorary Vice President of Royal Future UK, I do have a very uh, small interest in a registered agricultural holding. Uh, anyone else wish to make? No. Okay, sorry. I will now, uh, as I've been corrected and rightly so, pass you to the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross, for the first question. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, um, we have in our papers here um, a statement that says uh, this year, for the first time, the total operating costs for the Scottish Government have been aligned with the portfolio budgets that they support. And we see here um, that the rural economy's operating costs are £89 million. Pound. Can you explain to us and take us through um, how these operating costs are actually spent? Well, th thank you, um, Gail Ross, for that question. The operating cost budget uh, has increased by £37 million in a single year, but it's not comparable with previous years. The true growth is around 4%, and the change supports much greater scrutiny of operating costs, particularly over time, as we continue to present operating costs in this way in future years. The increase in rural economy operating costs includes costs previously held under the separate CAP compliance budget line, an element of resource that was previously within the administration budget, an allowance for pay inflation and preparatory work for EU exit, Brexit issues, uh, alongside business as usual delivery of CAP implementation, animal health and welfare services, agricultural science and support for agriculture, crofting and the rural economy policies. Uh, so uh, I, I know that um, officials should uh, be able to provide more detail if that is required, uh, convener, and we can always write with more detail should that be required. But that's the headline explanation for the figures this year. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think we would like to get some more detail if that can be provided. Um, Andrew Watson. So the majority of that operating budget relates to the Agriculture and Rural Economy uh, Directorate within the Scottish Government. So we have close to 1,000 staff, so it's a very significant part of the Scottish Government uh, total staffing complement. So the majority of the operating costs relate to that part of Mr Young's portfolio, um, but clearly there are other elements of the portfolio which are funded through that uh, as well. As Mr Young describes, across Scottish Government there's been a change in the budget presentation this year around operating costs. Um, at the back of the budget, there's a quite a substantial explanation of how that's been derived, Annex G in the document, and that sets out that on a roughly like-for-like -like basis, the year-on-year -year change in the operating cost is around four million for the rural economy portfolio, rather than the, the headline 37 that's elsewhere in the document. So, we can obviously provide more information in writing if it's helpful, but Annex G sets out quite a clear explanation of why there's a change this year. Okay, um, and. Do you see any possibility of reducing these operating costs in future at all? Do you want to? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, our current projections are for a pretty steady state in our resourcing, particularly in the Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate, which I know, uh, know um, the best. Um, what we've done for the current financial year, as Mr Ewing has said, is um, uh, put some resource in to uh, respond to the challenges presented by Brexit. So we have a dual task of business as usual plus preparing for Brexit. What we're not planning to do uh, at the moment anyway for 1920 is significantly expand our staffing complement. Having said that, clearly events of the next few weeks will have a, a huge impact on our business planning for financial year 1920. We're no different in that respect from many other parts of the public sector. So it's a watching brief in relation to that. But the plans set out in the draft budget are for a steady state in terms of our resourcing. Final point is that, as you'll be aware from other evidence sessions, we are looking to um, cut back our reliance on external contractors over the current year as we transition away from the significant um, work around cap IT futures. And that's something that we'll definitely look to do uh, as we you know, enter a more steady state around that part of our, our business. I'm glad you came on to it, Cap. I was going to ask as well about the operating costs. Um, the ARE operating budget line, we see that it's gone from uh, 62.9 million 2017-18, 82 million 18-19, and 129.9 million in 1920. Can you tell us why these costs are increasing so rapidly year on year? 
So um, in relation to the previous year, the 1718 figure, the jump from that year into 1819, the main driver of that was a change in our depreciation budget. So it's a non-cash line in the budget, and that relates to the position we were at in terms of transitioning out of IT futures. So that's not a change, an increase that um, affects public services and goods. It's an, largely an accounting adjustment for depreciation. And then the jump from 1819 to 1920, as I've described, on a like-for-like -like basis is around 4 million. And that's largely to do with um, pay inflation in relation to public sector pay policy for um, the 1,000 odd staff that we have and inflation around contractor salaries as well. So the the year-on-year -year change, 1718 to 1819, primarily to do with depreciation, 1819 to 1920, is a modest increase around pay inflation. How do you see this increasing as we go on? Is it gonna, are we going to still be spending the same amount? Is it going to go up? Can we possibly get that down? So uh, we have you know, clear plans around efficiencies. So um, uh, as again, in common with other parts of the public sector, we do look to drive out efficiencies. An example of that is reducing our reliance on contractors, for, for example. Um, the challenge we have in terms of forecasting our future cost base in terms of staffing is, is, is Brexit. So um, one of the reasons just now that we're such a large part of course Scottish government is the, um, uh, the impact of the regulatory uh, position around cap. So there's a large overhead in relation to our regulatory requirements and we need staff across the country to administer that. Clearly there's multiple scenarios around Brexit and the future of cap. So the, 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 um, the path we take through that will have an impact in the medium term on the number of staff we need, what they need to do and where they're located. But as, as you know, it's very difficult to predict where that, will, where that will head. The government's policy just now is around stability and simplicity. As you know, we've set out a plan to get us from here to 2024 that is largely around providing stability to farmers and crofters. And you can make an assumption around that that you need broadly the same core workforce to deliver that. But clearly that depends on certain outcomes around, around Brexit and, and, and CAP. Um, Mike, do you have some yeah. questions? Sir? Could I, um, I want to refer to, ta if it's helpful, the officials may have in front of them, and the minister might have in front of them, table 12.01, spending plans level two, is a, a box in there. And um, I'm just looking at the total, if you remove operating costs and non-cash and capital and financial transactions, the total cost for the rural economy uh, goes from this current year of 362.1 million to 351 million. Uh, that's in a fall of 11.1 uh, million pounds, which is a 3% a fall. And I, I'm just raising this because I've just heard what the minister said at the very beginning. I think I, I, think I caught him saying it was a 0.9% fall, but, but the, these figures would show it's like a 3% fall. I think David Blair is anxious to, <laughs> to explain the stats. Um, there's a very simple explanation for that one, um, which is that the, um, uh, the uh, as you say, 11% fall is um, almost entirely made up of a change in non-cash in Highlands and Islands Enterprise provision. Um, so if you look into the detail a little bit more, I can refer you to a particular budget of if you could find me the one that's we've published, that which will help the committee. Um, uh, it's about £10 million pounds adjustment to the non-cash in Highlands and Islands. So the difference is very, very small, and that's the 0.9 that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so the 0.9 that was quoted was the total resource spending, the manipulable spending that, uh, at the discretion of the Cabinet Secretary. So and that, the, those are the published figures. So that, if, I, if I just focus on that box, then on the rural, rural economy enterprise, which I assume Highlands and Islands therefore is part, part of, that's falling next year from... 81.7 million now to 74.4. That's right. That's that count, That accounts for 7.3 million. Um, so, so, so the page 172 of the uh, published budget. Um, if you look under the of which section of the of that page, um, so you're right to quote those figures. Um, the non-cash element drops from 15 million to 5 million. So that's a, a 10 million pounds non-cash reduction in the total resource envelope. Mm -hmm. Do you mind me asking why that's happened? Um, it was a, it's, it's a simply matter of um, Highlands and Islands readjusting their um, depreciation estimate and submitting that. Depreciation? It's a, yes, it's depreciation for assets. Okay, thank you. Seems like a heck sorry. of a lot of depreciation. Can I just ask if, if, if the whole HIE budget and, and depreciation needs to be reviewed in light of the situation that's happened with Cairngorm Mountain? 
Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a matter for HIE to, to um, calculate its depreciation in line with the relevant uh, accounting standards. Um, so they will update that on the, in the normal course of things, depending on uh, what assets they have at a given moment. So, so yes is basically the answer. They will keep that under review, and we will adjust it um, uh, as we go through the, through the year and as we get to the next year's budget. Because there's, there's likely to be increased costs and, and probably looking at the state of some of the assets, to yes. further depreciation on the assets which haven't been taken into account, especially if one looks at the, the st state of the funicular railway at the moment. It may be that depreciation is considerably more. Um, well, you're, you're right to raise that, convener, and uh, obviously this is something which is occupying, a, 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 quite rightly, a, a great deal of time on the part of uh, the senior management in HIE and, indeed, myself and officials. The funicular there will be funicular costs, there's no doubt about that, but these costs are not known and cannot be known at the current time. The situation, is, as has been made public, is that HIE instructed um, a firm of engineers, uh, COWI, C-O-W-I, uh, and their report, their final report, is expected to be made available fairly shortly. Um, it's anticipated that that report will not, as you would expect, contain cost estimates about what's required there will need, I think, to be a further assessment of what options following upon the conclusions of that report exist. Uh, the process, therefore, of ascertaining what the options will be and hence moving on to cost estimates is one which involves uh, very rigorous and careful professional advice and examination. So, uh, yes, there will be costs, but no, it's not possible for us at this current time to say what these costs are. And therefore, it's not really appropriate to make a financial provision in a budget for con a contingency where there's a, an expectation that there will be potentially a substantial cost element, but we're simply not in a position to know, you know uh, what that will be. But it's something that we're looking at very carefully and working, obviously, very closely with HIE around. And I'm very pleased, just in conclusion, that HE HIE have acted swiftly and professionally, not only to have excellent community engagement locally, but also to purchase snowmaking equipment uh, oh. a, a, as an investment to allow skiing to continue on Cairngorm, as has been the case, albeit in a much reduced uh, a level of activity. Um, so, just, just so I can understand, if I was doing a budget and I knew there was a, a potential cost coming down the line, uh, on it, I would make some prudent calculations in my mind what that anticipated cost may be to allow that not to be a surprise to the budget later in the say. Are you just saying that you'll deal with that when it comes along? Well, you see, it's not possible to know what the cost is. We know there will be a cost, but it's simply not possible before, before the experts have provided the report to know whether it will be a relatively modest or a very major cost. I mean, so in a budgetary sense, that, that does make it difficult. Um, so you're right to make the point that there will be a cost, but I would respectfully disagree that it's possible a, to assess that cost at the moment. But we have given consideration to incorporating flexibility within our capital budget um, due to competing priorities within the portfolio. It's possible to allocate 0.4 million for the funicular in the 2019 and 20 budget allocations. Um, but, of course, the process I've described of expert analysis of what the options are are likely to take, and quite rightly so, some time. It took many years to decide and then construct a funicular. Uh, we will have to see how serious the criticism in the Structural Engineers Report is, uh, and the Engineers Report, COI, is. Uh, but I expect, convener, that we will need to proceed with caution uh, in order to get further advice on that before we will be in a position to know what the bill is. But I hope that we are all committed across all parties to ensuring continuance of successful skiing and snow sports activity on Cairngorm as we are in the other um, four outdoor resorts in Scotland. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, I guess that you and I will have a different view on budgeting and contingency planning. But, John, you want to bring up a particular point? Well, just to clarify, to follow on to what the convener is saying, so are you saying, Cabinet Secretary, that if there was any extra expense in the actual year 1920, that could be managed within the overall budget? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, you know, obviously in government, contingencies arise. You know, things that you cannot foresee or the quantification of which you cannot foresee, these things arise every year. 
It's not possible, convener, nor is it prudent, if you have, say, 50 or 100 such contingencies to set aside an enormous amount of money in the belief that they may all fall to be, need to be dealt with in the course of one particular budget year. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in budgetary practice. Maybe my colleagues might want to... Um, a, a, I don't know if Mr Hutton, as the finance expert, can, can deal with the sort of the dry accountancy-like approach to this. But, you know, we can't simply set aside hundreds of millions of pounds in the... Uh, that, that's okay. In, as a dry, as that, that they may need to be spent in this financial year. I don't yes. really think... No, as a dry accountant, pressure. I'm quite happy with the, what you've said so far. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Stuart, on that, on that point, because I'd like to move to another point, which Peter... I just wanted to ask the obvious question. In accounting terms, is therefore this being treated as a contingent liability rather than a liability? Um, no, it doesn't appear in the accounts, then. We've, we've not entered into any contractual liabilities at this point in time, so there's right, no... So it's contingent? Yeah. And therefore would not appear in the, the financial provision? Uh, yeah. yeah. Not, not this year, anyhow. There's uh, an e estimate has been, a provision has been set aside. Until we get a firmer figure, um, we'll revise those estimates when more information is available. Peter, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Back to the agriculture and rural economy budget line. I mean, we see that it's more than doubled in the last three years, and you've explained that most of that is about salaries, I think, in the last year. I noticed that, that this budget also covers the IT system. Now, we know we've had huge problems in the past. We know that the IT system still isn't uh, fit for purpose, I would argue. Um, how much money are we still spending on this CAP IT system? So, um, as you'll obviously be familiar, we've given a range of evidence on that um, over the past past few months. Um, the budget includes a forecast of a significant reduction in capital spend on, I, on CAP IT. Um, so we're moving from a figure of around 26 million to a figure of around 11 million. And as Eddie Turnbull, I think one of my colleagues, has, has described to the, the committee in the past, that reflects the fact that we're moving away from having delivered the, the, the core functionality from the, the futures programme and into a period of stability, maintenance and enhancement as we go forward. So we feel able to reduce our capital budget requirement for Cap IT quite significantly in, in 1920. Can I understand that? You, you're, you're moving, before I come back to Peter, just so I understand, you are, you are moving away from a running cost per annum of the Cap IT project from £26 million pounds down to £11 million? Pounds. No, so just to be clear, so what I'm describing there is capital investment in uh, new uh, IT functionality rather than um, running costs and maintenance. So what, we're, what I'm describing there is the balance of expenditure will move um, uh, away from building new bits of kit into maintaining what we have. However, there's always a need year on year to reflect real world changes and respond to that. So as an example, um, cyber security is a key issue. We need to ensure that our systems are fit for purpose in that respect. And that does require investment on an ongoing basis. So that's the point I was trying to, to get across. I mean, I welcome that. Uh, so you, basically you're saying that the, the, the IT system as, you, as it now stands is, is pretty much fit for purpose. So you, it's just a, an ongoing cost. What about looking further forward? We know that we're, uh, you know, things are going to change quite dramatically as to how we support agriculture going forward. Does that mean that we now need to think seriously about designing a whole new system to, to cope with a whole new system that's going coming down the road post Brexit? Um, so, as you say, very uncertain landscape um, going forward. Um, what we have in terms of the RPNS system is a system that is rules-based and enables us um, to be reasonably flexible going forward um, uh, on the basis that um, in the short term, certainly under a negotiated deal settlement, and clearly that's, that's a movable feast, um, you're continuing to administer schemes for a period of time that are broadly similar to the schemes that we have uh, at the moment. Um, if in the long-term future we were to move to a substantially different way of putting money into the rural economy, then clearly systems development would be part of that, that programme of work. It's very hard to predict where that's going to take us. Mm -hmm. What the Cabinet Secretary has outlined um, in terms of stability and simplicity is a transition period where um, we will look to simplify existing CAP schemes, um, but broadly speaking, keep that platform stable. And therefore, the IT system that we have in place is equipped to help us deliver, deliver that. Okay. Can I, can I just follow that up by... by uh, 
what Peter just said, and I just want to make sure I understand that, that the current CAP IT system is capable of functioning and working on its own and delivering the payments on time, and therefore the extra money that you're taking to use that is just to buy additional equipment or software to protect that equipment. Um, so that's an element. So the cybersecurity piece of that is one is one element. Um, another would be uh, any investment required annually if there are small changes to, to scheme rules, for, for, you know, for, for example. Uh, another project we have un underway is our land parcel identification system, which again we've given evidence on in the past. So we're reaching the final stages of that programme, but it's not yet complete. So I suppose the key point here is the budget doesn't solely relate to the RPNS system for making payments. It relates to a suite of IT, um, IT products. So we can obviously give you some more information on that if it's helpful. But that, well, uh, I just want to drill down. The system is currently capable then of making payments as it was designed to do on time in, with, with minimum input. Correct. So the extra staff that were taken on to implement the failure of the system till the system was up and running are still required in the office to run that system. So probably two, two parts to that. So firstly, you've got the um, technical expertise to develop and implement the system. And that is where we're looking to significantly reduce our costs in relation to, for example, IT contractors going forward. The second and largest element of our staffing budget relates to all of the other work that goes into the administration of CAP in Scotland. Part of that, absolutely, is, for example, area office staff processing payments. A significant part of that is the, 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 the wide range of land inspections that we have to undertake and so on. So um, it's not a case that we can substantially reduce our overall staffing complement because we've delivered RPNS to the place that we've delivered it. But there should be some efficiencies, particularly in the IT development space, and that's what we've budgeted for in the 1920 budget um, in terms of, of reducing that, um, that reliance. So, Cabinet Secretary, just to clarify uh, from you, if I may, is that as the computer system is working uh, well and able to deliver payments, will, be, will this be the last year um, of a situation where you have to have loans? And if it's working so well now, will we not have to have loans and we can get, or farmers can get their payments uh, on time as they've done in the past, which has usually been before Christmas? Well, I was very pleased that the loan system that we introduced has allowed progressively farmers to receive most of the money earlier than they used to receive 90% in October, as opposed to uh, payments in full in December, January. So actually, as a matter of fact, Scottish farmers, uh, most Scottish farmers receive most of the money, mostly 90%, earlier than other farmers in the UK. Um, uh, your question, Convener, is will loans be required in the future? We will, re we will keep that under review. Uh, it's a matter of judgment, and that decision will be taken by me at the appropriate time. But the overriding criteria is to ensure that farmers continue to receive the funding one way or the other uh, at the right time. That's the practical thing from a business point of view, and that's, what, uh, that's, that's the key consideration that informs um, my decision making. Uh, just this morning, I had a, a weekly conference call with officials about CAP IT. Uh, we uh, are well over 99% of the Pillar 1 payments this year, uh, of the 18 year, uh, and I think there are, uh, from memory, I think there are only, the tail is down to 33, and of those, three were ineligible for a loan, uh, and the remainder were offered a loan, and most of them took up a loan. So even although there's a, a, a very small tail remaining, in almost every case, a loan was, was taken up where it was, where it was due, and others were offered but not taken up. So um, you know, al although I'm not satisfied we're, we're there yet, convener, I'll be quite candid with that. Uh, my job is to produce practical solutions, and loans, I believe, have served that purpose and served it pretty well. Uh, and therefore, if they are continued to be required, then, then I would obviously look at that uh, a, in, the, in the way that I've described, with the imperative that farmers and crofters get their money on time uh, one way or the other. I, I'm sure farmers will welcome that, and I'm sure they'll also welcome to hear that the, the IT system is working. Mike. Thanks, Convener. Can I just go back to Table 1201 on EU support? 
Uh, EU support and related services is at the moment, well, for the coming year, 176.8 million. Can any of the officials, see, I don't expect the minister to have these facts to hand, but perhaps the officials might, how much, um, how much does it cost to administer the 176 million that is going to our farming businesses? How much does it actually cost? What I'm trying to get at is, of that 176 million pounds, how much extra does it cost us to administer that? Who's answering it? Oh, um, sorry. Um, so the, um, within the um, ARE operations line, as we've said, there are a number of elements. Um, the biggest part, as Andrew has said, is the, um, uh, the running costs effectively for um, the Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate. Um, the biggest part of that is payments and administration, which is um, the administration of uh, CAP primarily. There are many other parts of the Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate, so I want to be clear that this is not a complete, um, this is not all attributable to, to CAP. Um, but the figure um, is uh, £86.6 million pounds, um, uh, revenue. Sorry, have I got this right then? Half of the budget to get to get 176 million half it costs us half again to get it out to is that what you're saying? Um, no, we don't we don't spend half that money on, on administration. That's separate. But well, that's what I'm that's my what I'm trying to find a very simple uh, a simple question. I know it might be difficult. But perhaps you could write to us afterwards. Yes, yes. I'd just like to know of getting that 176 million help to our farming businesses. How much does it cost us to, to get it to them? So I think the, the if I can um, reframe that slightly, the amount of money we spend, we, we transfer out, it's not 176 million, it's more like 533 million pounds in EU funding. So that's the money we're spending, that we're, we're, we're passing into the, into the rural community. Mm -hmm. So the 86 million pounds should be compared against that and not okay. the net, uh, because, the, because the 176 that you're talking about is net of EU funding coming in. Nah. So it's a net figure. But the it, gross it, would figure, be very, the, it would be very helpful if the committee could receive a breakdown of that. We can absolutely provide you with a bit more detail. I think that would be helpful because I think there's some Something confusion. Mr Rumble's perfectly reasonable question, we'll do that. Maybe I can just make a slightly different point, which is that um, many EU states have actually negotiated top-ups to their rural development budget. Uh, unfortunately, the UK government did not try to negotiate such a top-up. <clears throat> Ireland negotiated a top-up and its average per hectare P2 payment rate is almost six times that of Scotland. So looking at it from the point of view of seeking to maximise a budget convener, I think it's most unfortunate that the UK did not take the, a different approach. Different point to the question that Mr Rumbles had asked. Richard, your, your, your point next. You wanted a yeah, question. Yeah, there. surely the £89 million we're paying out in staff costs. Uh, is, uh, the, uh, the administration of this, the, the question that Mr Rumbles has asked, is included, included in the administration of, of that. So um, I really don't see the point uh, that Mr Rumbles is getting at, that basically you know, we are paying out staff costs and the staff are doing everything right across the board, include, including administrating the, uh, the paying out of cap payments. <coughs> so, it's, so it's in the staff costs, surely. But you're correct. So, <clears throat> so the, the operation, so if you look at table 12.02, um, the area operations costs there, um, which, we've, which we've described. I mean, as David is describing, the budget of 86 million will cover all of the functions that we have. Some of these are nothing to do with, with um, the uh, CAP IT system, for example, we'll cover the costs of, our, of, of SASA, for example, animal health and welfare, um, policy development elsewhere in the, in the portfolio. So you know, it's, it's a holistic figure, as you, as you describe. I think the point is it, it would be very helpful for the committee to understand how much it actually costs to make the payments to the farmers under the uh, payments that are listed in 1202, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments. That's what, what I think has been effectively asked for. Perfectly reasonable questions. We will, we will write to the committee with that. I mean, I think the point that Andrew Watson was making is that there's a, a large number of different divisions, not, sim not simply those dealing with the CAP IT. There's lots of other functions to do with a whole range of rural uh, activity and policy. And I think in our reply, we'll try and address that in the round as well to look at you know, the various costs in respect of each of these functions, if that would be helpful to Mr Rumbles and the committee convener. 
Thank you very much for that offer, and yes, it would be. Uh, Mr Lyle, I think you've got the next question. Yes, I'll turn to forestry. Uh, cabinet. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. In October, uh, the Scottish Government published its economic action plan. It stated, we are committed to meeting our target of planting 10,000 hectares of woodland every year and increase this by a further 50% by 2025. The budget for the woodland grants remains at 46 million, and basically we only we only planted 7,100 uh, hectares of woodland in Scotland in 2017-18, and the 10,000 target was never met. Confor Conf state that actually to meet the 10,000 target, the budget would need to be increased by 15 million, uh, further 15 million. So, in your opinion, what is preventing the 10,000 hectare? per year planting target from being met? Well, I, th I think we are making, I'll, I'll bring in Joe O'Hara in, in a minute to answer the detail of the question, if I may, Convener. But suffice to say, I think we are making very big progress. I think Comfort recognised that, the sector recognised that, the NGOs uh, also recognised that, both in, in, in the plantation of, of uh, native species and also uh, commercial species. And whereas we have not met the target for, for some years, uh, uh, we are working very hard to ensure that that will change in future. The one point I would make, and I did make, allude to this very briefly in my opening remarks, Convener, is that um, because the price of timber is at, uh, I believe, an all-time high, the commercial receipts in forest enterprise have been, very, has been commensurately high. And obviously that has allowed us to, to use that additional funding, as you would expect, and I think is prudent in order to invest for the future in replanting. But if, uh, you know, if a more series of technical responses is required, perhaps Joe O'Hara could, could amplify that, because it's an extremely important topic that Mr Lylas has raised, as always. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so the 7,100 that was achieved in 1718 was in the 1718 budget. OK, so that was the planting season. The, the last one. So, um, so last year's budget um, for grants is the same as the one projected for next year. Um, in terms of the approvals for the current year, um, we have had applications for and approved um, over 10,000 hectares, and we have the budget cover to fund those. As you'll be aware, um, the way that the forestry grants are structured are that there's a, a, a large payment in year one, um, and then there are subsequent payments annually after that. So the figures that Comfort put forward were for the total payment, sort of squashed up the, um, the subsequent year's payments and the upfront cost. So in, in the current year and next year, um, we have enough to pay for the, the upfront cost, so the year one cost, plus the historic payments, which are for a smaller area, um, for the subsequent year payments, which is why the maths is a wee bit complicated in terms of saying you can't just say it costs four and a half thousand for um, a forestry scheme, therefore for 10,000 hectares you need, four, um, you need 45 million because there's a tail to that payment, okay? The, pe the money that we have in here um, is that in, in this draft budget is the same as we had for the current year, and that is sufficient to pay for the 10,000 hectares target that we have committed to. And we have enough applications that we have approved um, for the current year, for 1819, um, and we have enough submitted, almost, we have 9,500 submitted for next year. So that's how the numbers tie up. So okay. these applications can move to the right convener, so we're not complacent about meeting the target for this year. We're, we're hopeful, but not complacent, and we're working very hard to, to do the achievement of the target this year. Uh, that's uh, welcome news, and basically, uh, you know, as I said before, Confor's continually telling us that we have to plant, plant today for, to, uh, uh, well, plant for tomorrow, uh, our plan for tomorrow. Um, we're still important wood, and, and as you say, the price is is going up through the roof. So will the budget for woodland grants increase over the coming years to meet the 2025 20, target, in your opinion? Well, um, I, I think there will need to be a commensurate increase because, as Mr Lyle knows, the target currently is 10,000, but it rises on a stepped basis to, to 15,000 by 225. And therefore, there will need to be an increase in budget. Uh, and obviously, 
the, uh, we have been heavily reliant from the EU uh, for our forestry funding because um, the funding is made under Pillar 2 of the CAP. So um, the, the question remains what will replace the existing EU funding. The current position is that um, contracts entered into up to year end 2020 will be honoured. But beyond that, there's no assurance. And therefore, when I met Michael Gove on Monday, one of the many things I raised with him was um, a further assurances that the um, funding will be available. And the reason I did so, Convener, is that Confor wrote to Mr Gove, I think Mr Sulman wrote to Mr Gove, pointing out that the average woodland scheme takes 18 months uh, to take through the process, but also nurseries work on a three-yearly time scale, that they need three years in advance to, to work out what their stock is going to be. And plainly, there are only a small number of nurseries in Scotland. They need to plan ahead. They need to have investor confidence. And I'm afraid to say that there are some signs that, as Comfort indicates, representing the, the commercial side and the growers, that some signs that investment confidence is being impaired slightly by the lack of clarity beyond year end 220. And therefore, Comfort have asked for, at the very least, the same level of assurance for forestry as has been received for farming, namely up to the end of 222. Uh, and I asked Mr Gove if that could be done, but he appeared to say no. Do, do, uh, do you have any more? That's fine. Peter, you wanted to ask you. a question, then I'm going to come to Colin. Yeah, well, I just, I just wonder how flexible we can be if, you know, we know there's a, there's a, there's a big interest in planting more trees, and I'm pleased to hear that you're going to hit the 10,000 at least this year. How flexible can we be if, if we want to go to the 15,000 hectares? I mean, are we, are we going to make sure that that doesn't happen before 2025, or is there enough flexibility that if the, the bids came forward um, before 2025 to plant 15,000 hectares, are we, are we content that we could fund that? Well, we do. Uh, I mean, I'll answer them high level, and if Joe wants to come in with any details, she can. I mean, plainly, we have to budget for the, meeting the target. We don't plan to budget for meeting the target plus 50 per cent. We don't plan for that. So there is funding sufficient for meeting the target. That's the point that Joe O'Hara made. There is not funding sufficient for meeting the target and, and exceeding it by 50 per cent. But, but you know, plainly, there's a desire to do more in forestry. And as Mr Chapman will know, that desire, and I'm very pleased to say, is extending to an increasing number of farmers and crofters and small, small air landowners. And I'm very keen to encourage that process and make it easier. Very, very keen indeed. Um, and therefore, we do want there to be more applications coming forward, but we do need the budget line. So, you know, I do hope that we can work more in partnership with the UK uh, government to do that. And just, just one final thing. We haven't promised we'll meet for sure at the target this year. We're hopeful, but I would far rather um, uh, under-promise and over-deliver than the converse. I, I think we'll just go on to the next question, because I, I, I think Joe's was sort of nodded she was happy with that. Nothing to add. So, so Colin. It's just a... You're live. A follow-up. I um, appreciate most of the impact in, in small rural communities and rural roads comes at the point of extraction uh, rather than planting. But, but can you say what's likely to happen to the timber transport fund uh, going forward? Because um, obviously there was an increase last year, but I can't see a budget line for what, what that's likely to be. Are we going to continue to see an increase in the timber transport fund? Because that's obviously really important to, to communities impacted by, by the growth in forestry. Well, the £5 million has been paid by Transport Scotland, and we found efficiencies within that. And we perhaps can write to you with the detail of that, because it's not entirely straightforward. But one of the decisions I made early on, in fact, at the outset, was that because, um, convener, of the importance of being able to access our forests, we needed to do a bit more for, for um, enabling that, whether through provision in road, rail, bridges, sea. Uh, and of course, the, conversely, if we don't do that, then trees, once they reach maturation, can become <coughs> windblown, and then the commercial value depletes either to zero or, or very much a lesser value, as well as the environmental degradation which can flow from that. So actually, I think it's a good investment to invest further in our timber transport fund. And thanks to professionals such as Alistair Speedy and local committees throughout the country, uh, Mr Smith, who look at local circumstances at a local level, I think we, we have invested that money pretty wisely. And again, we've got a whole list of particular projects that have been enabled by the additional funding. That has been put forward at my behest. I'm very happy to produce that list for 
the committee, and I would very much welcome, actually, convener, just to conclude with this point, the committee's support for seeing that we continue this, this funding. The, the, ben the areas that would benefit actually include, for example, um, Gail Ross's uh, case in Essex and Sutherland, where there are a very large number of forests that are sort of entrapped uh, and where access to, to get the, the mature trees out is increasingly difficult, uh, largely because of logistical transport reasons. Glenn, you want to follow up? Uh, just, just, just to be clear, what, do, do, we, do, we, do, do we know what the figure is this year? Because obviously it did actually rise last year. It was, it was a very welcome rise. I think it went from five million to, to seven and a half million was made available. Is that seven and a half million continuing or is that the base figure five million? Joe, I think. That would be helpful. So, um, so the, the five million from the transport budget, which doesn't appear in this budget, mm -hmm. will continue. That was, a, that was new money, as Mr Ewing said, two years ago. So over the last two years, there's been an addition 10 million gone into timber transport. That's in addition to the money that's on, on, on our budget. So what is going to happen this year? As Mr Ewing says, we have, all, we have all the list of schemes. So we're still maintaining that additional money that was new money that came in two years ago. And there's a small reduction on the contribution that's going from the, the Forestry Scotland line into, into timber transport. But the net impact is still uh, retaining a substantial uplift on where we were two years ago. So, so just, uh, so I, just, I probably haven't followed you there. So just to be clear, the, the grant specifically for the timber transport fund, that level will remain this year as it was last year. It's reducing by 800,000. Reducing, okay. But the overall, that's of a total of 7.5, not of the total of 2.5 that's shown in the budget. Okay. Does that answer the question? I just, I just, I mean, I just, I just, the simple point is that the, 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 the Timber Transport Fund, for what I understand, in 2017-18 was £5 million. That was available in grants often match funded by local authorities. Last year, that level went up to seven and a half million pounds. Half the year before yeah, as yeah. well. So, so um, but that's not seven and a half million 2019-20 in terms of the grants that would be made available for um, projects that local authorities will bid for. Will that, 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 that seven and a half million pounds be available for those grants this year? So under our, under our current proposals, that will reduce by 800,000. It will reduce by 800,000, yeah. okay. Um, can I, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask a question, um, and perhaps you could point me to it, I've, I've struggled to find it. Forestry sales in the forthcoming year, what are the predicted sales and will they match the predicted purchases and has that been the case for the last five years? And I'm very happy to take that Sorry. as a written answer. Right, okay, I think, just to clarify, do you, do you mean um, sales of holdings of land as opposed to sales of timber? Because, Correct, you know, there's sales different. of the actual asset. I'm very happy to take that. Uh, well, I, I think perfectly fair question, and we did discuss that during the course of the forestry bill. So we will we will go back to it's really forest enterprise. I think that primarily yeah, dealing with that. So that. Joe Hara heads up Forestry Commission in Scotland. Yes. So we will go to Trevor Owen and ask him to provide a letter with that information for the committee. And and it would then just be a question uh, uh, as a follow up to that would be where the money goes if there's a balance, i.e. if there's more receipt than there is uh, expenditure, i.e. you get more from land sales than you do have to pay for land purchases, where that money goes. So that, that would be helpful as a written yeah, answer. Well, obviously we need to, to look at the, the round of activity, including the commercial income from sale of, of timber, which is a major and very successful part of forestry. And also, of course, we can't ignore the fact that I, I think around about 10 million per annum comes from renewable energy because of the success of the renewable energy policy. So, you know, it has been a, a, a fairly successful story, convener, and the more successful it is, the easier it is for that money to be reinvested, both in plantings and purchases um, of new land for forestry. I, I, I take that point. The, the specific point I'm asking on is sales of land, not on timber or, or, or income received from... Joe? Uh, uh, one point just to make on that is obviously when you have an annual budget cycle, they don't always match up in any one year. Um, That's so why I did ask for it over plan. five years so I could over see how years. it right, balanced sorry. because the, the, the Scottish Parliament decided some time ago that the policy would be that land could be sold from the forest estate, but it would have to be replaced. And I just want to understand that. And I'd like to understand that, uh, uh, whether that's going forward. Peter, yours is the next question. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I want to uh, ask some questions about LFAS money. At the beginning of last week, it was widely reported that the Cabinet Secretary had confirmed that the 2019 LFAS money would be cut by 20 per cent, and then the following year, the 2020 monies would be cut by 60 per cent. But then three days later, during our, our uh, debate in the Chamber, it was confirmed by the Cabinet Secretary that there would only be cuts of 20 per cent in both years. Now, I welcome that, very much welcome that. But I just wonder what's cha what changed in three days. Did the EU uh, change the rules, or is this new money a new scheme, or how, how has the Cabinet Secretary managed to achieve this uh, change? Um, Make a point. Sorry, uh, Stuart, you, you, you're making comments. I think it's fair the Cabinet Secretary answers, answers the comments. You may disagree with what a fellow member of the committee says, and I'm very happy for you to do that. But when a question is being asked, I don't think you should be answering for the Cabinet Secretary. That is an observation. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, convener, with respect, I don't agree with the way that Mr Chapman has characterised it, although I, I think I understand where he's coming from, and let me just talk, talk through where, where we are. Um, first of all, it's important to stress that this year, which is the 2018 LFAS payment year, LFAS is being maintained at 100%. It was due to have been reduced to 80%, but because of the late intervention um, a, by the European Parliament a, a permitting that to remain at 100%, we took the decision towards the end of the financial year to maintain it at 100%. Um, and a, so I think it's important to stress that because I think there is a slight risk that people <coughs> listening into this may think that their payments are going to be reduced this year. That, that's not the case, and I, I think Mr Chapman understands that. So, I think, it's just, I, agree that, yeah. I think it's just useful to, to clarify that for, for the record. Um, and secondly, the, the, the uh, position in respect of next year is that according to the EU cap rules, the payment, maximum payment under the regime can be 80%. Uh, the year following that, the proposal was that the payment must be reduced to 20%. However, the, that was changed uh, a following intervention from the Commission and Council to 40%, and indeed that change was uh, discussed at the December Council in Brussels, which I attended. So the reference to, to uh, going down to a lower figure than 80% is simply that the EU rules have changed. What has not changed is my approach to this, which is that you know we uh, will continue uh, to maintain 100% this year. Next year, we have committed to maintaining it at 80%. Uh, and the year after that, uh, uh, we have committed to finding a workaround in order to maintain it at 80%. In other words, it is not acceptable to me and this government that there is a payment to farmers and crofters below 80%. To be, in fairness to myself, Mr Chapman, I have made that clear in the parliamentary chamber, I think on two previous occasions prior to the debate last week. Um, but I can understand where some confusion may have crept in, and I hope today has dispelled that. The last point I make is this, convener, that I don't want to see the payment reduced to 80 per cent. I would like to see to find a means of avoiding that, if, if we possibly can. Uh, and I, I, I think it's reasonable to, uh, to, to hope that the review, which is un being undertaken by Lord Bew, uh, which incidentally is not really a convergence view review any longer. As Michael Gove said on Monday, it's a UK inter-allocation review. And I can explain that if asked. Uh, but uh, I'm hopeful that that <laughs> review process will result in there being released additional funding, which would be sufficient for us to fund a workaround uh, to maintain our fast payments, if it is possible to do so at 100%, both in 2019 uh, and 220, if that is possible. Mm. And we are working with stakeholders towards that objective. Yeah, well, I mean, there was confusion. And I mean, you just need to look at last week's Scottish Farmer and the, the front page quite categorically <laughs> stated uh, that it was your, uh, you had stated that these cuts were coming down the, the line. So, I mean, I, I don't make any apologies for that. But uh, how, how confident are you that you can maintain it, the cut at 80% in, in 2020 year? Because you are saying it's a, it's a workaround. Um, we are still going to be under the, the rules, the EU rules in 2020, as I understand it. 
And how, is this going to be allowed? I mean, how, how confident can our farmers be that you will be able to maintain it at a 20% cut rather than a 60% cut in, in the year 2020? Well, uh, we, will, <coughs> we will work extremely hard towards that objective. Uh, I've described one route by which that could be done. Uh, I should also say, for the sake of completeness, convener, that we have been working, and Kirsten Bendos has been uh, involved in this work, with, along with other officials, uh, with uh, key stakeholders, including the NFUS, in order to find a workaround. And there's at least two ways by which this could be done. One, de minimis payments, uh, up to, I think, 15,000 euros. Uh, and secondly, flexibility. Now, these are complex matters. There are technicalities involved. But it's my hope that sooner rather than later, uh, we can find a workaround. I should stress, and uh, uh, Ms Meadows would correct me if I didn't, that one of the difficulties about finding a workaround is that the rules have not been established and set for the years 2020 and 21, and therefore, in the absence of clear rules, a workaround of those rules is uh, obviously logically not entirely possible other than in outline or in theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm determined to provide uh, continued hill farmer support. It's absolutely essential. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it would only be with great reluctance uh, and uh, really no other options that would be practical that we would uh, that we would be forced to see a reduction to 80 per cent. The Crofters Union have said that that's just about livable with. I'd prefer not to, to bring that, put that to the test if we can, convener. And the last thing I'd say is that, you know, I do hope the UK government will accept its responsibilities for hill farmers as well in the, in the post-Brexit situation, if indeed we, we are going to be in a post-Brexit situation. Maureen, I think you wanted to follow that up. Um, yes, kind of two points. The, uh, the, the equivalent in England of Elfas, I think, was stopped in 2010. Do we know what the effects of that has been on hill farmers so that we get an idea of what might happen uh, in Scotland? And secondly, uh, on convergence, I mean, it looks as if we have just to write off the fact that we were due 167 million, I think it was, and it's not come. But I understand there has been another uh, amount of convergence funding come from Europe in the meantime. Is there any chance that we might get that? Well, um, for, first of all, you know, we have most certainly not written off Scotland's claim and the claim of Scotland's hill farmers and crofters for the 160 million pounds, which was intended by the EU for those farmers who qualified financially, and only Scotland's hill farmers qualified financially. It's just a matter of incontrovertible fact. So uh, we have not and will not abandon right off that, that claim, and it's 160 million. We've also said uh, to assure Ms. Watt that, that if we are successful in recouping that money from the UK Treasury, uh, who applied it for other means, uh, then it will be, uh, we would ensure that the, the farmers and crofters benefit therefrom. Secondly, the question was about the um, position in England. I, I can confirm that they ceased their LFA scheme, uh, I think, in 2010. Uh, quite what they've replaced it with, I'm afraid I don't know. I, I don't spend that much time studying you know, the English system. I've got enough on my plate to, uh, to uh, uh, deal with the Scottish one, which I hope you understand. But, but certainly, we've decided here in Scotland, with devolved powers, that this is uh, an important means of providing essential support for those who, who I think most need it. And that's the key point. And finally, on the convergence point, um, you know, Michael Gove did agree, uh, I think around the, the end of 2017, at a meeting with me and subsequently, uh, that there would be a convergence review. And this, of course, was promised by um, Owen Patterson back in 2014, I believe, convener. What we have now, uh, Michael Gove on Monday described as an, a UK interallocation review because the Treasury intervened and they changed the terms of reference unilaterally without consulting the Scottish Government or indeed the other devolved administrations so that they specifically excluded from the remit of the inquiry uh, looking at any adjustment of funding uh, prior to now. In other words, they specifically ruled out any uh, revisiting of what happened to 160 million. Uh, I, I think that's completely wrong and indefensible, but because, as Ms. Watt absolutely rightly says, there is the possibility that there's other convergence funding coming forward, then I felt it prudent to allow the review to go ahead to look at that particular issue. But I'm afraid, you know, Mr. Gove has broken his promise, convener. He promised there would be a convergence review. He now admits that this is not a convergence review. And therefore, 
it is absolutely right and proper that as the Scottish Farming Minister that we don't let this drop, but we pursue matters in a pragmatic way as well as a principled fashion. Peter, you want to ask a question, which will be the final one? Just, well, I mean, let's hope we can, we can contain the cuts to Elfast to 20%. Have you, have, you done, have you made any, a, a, have you looked into what kind of serious effect even that 20% cut might have to some of our most under pressure farmers in, the, in, in Scotland? Well, well, obviously, under the current rules, uh, uh, Elfast claimants will, in most part, be entitled to single farm payments. So it's not the sole source of income. But you know, I'm aware, appraised of how important a, that that is. Uh, I don't think it's. I mean, this year we're maintaining it at 100%. I would like to try to see what we can do, convener, as I've described, to avoid going to 80% if we can find a method of doing so. And I don't want to raise expectations uh, uh, unduly highly, but that's that's my hope and intent. I mean, the real threat to hill farmers at the moment is the loss of uh, markets, EU markets, for our lamb. And I heard yesterday at a food resilience meeting that it's expected that the price of lamb will have, have, in the event of a no deal, with very limited opportunities for hill farmers, either to delay going to market or to find a better price elsewhere. So the immediate threat, actually, I would, I would suggest, convener, is Let's get this no deal off the table now, using the powers that there is for that purpose, and we can get back then to uh, trying to work out sensible policies for supporting our hill farmers in Scotland. Secretary, the last point being a purely political one. We, there are some questions that we've asked for answers for, uh, which we very much welcome as part of the budget scrutiny. I'd like to thank you and your officials this morning for coming along and answering the questions. And the clerks will liaise with, with your office to, regarding the questions we've asked for. I'd ask committee members uh, to take no more than a five minute break and I now suspend the meeting. Thank you.
I'd like to move into session with panel two, and I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his officials, Mike Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary of Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. Francis Pasiti, have I got that right? Good. Thank you, Director of Aviation, Maritime, Freights and Canals. Mike Baxter, the Director for Finance and Corporate Services, and Robbie McGee, the Head of Digital Connectivity Policy for the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, um, I'm delighted if you'd like to make an opening statement of three minutes and no more, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I welcome the chance to give evidence on how my portfolio spend will contribute to our programme for government commitments. Our overarching aim is to promote sustainable, inclusive economic growth, and we'll do this by extending superfast broadband and 4G mobile coverage, investing in low-carbon transport and promoting active travel, enabling better journey times, connections, quality and reducing emissions, uh, supporting economic development in cities and their regions, modernising Scotland's energy system, uh, tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency, and supporting low-carbon infrastructure transition. Uh, this reflects the £259 million pounds or 10% overall increase in the transport infrastructure and connectivity budget in the 2019-20 budget. Convener, I'd like to highlight ferry services given the committee's uh, pre-budget scrutiny of this area. Uh, we'll continue to support ferry services on the Clyde and Hebridee and Northern Isles routes, uh, boosting those economies and sustainability of their communities. Uh, we maintain the road equivalent tariff fares on the Clyde and Hebridean ferry services and, reduced, uh, and the reduced passenger and car fares on Shetland. Uh, we will continue to address the complaint against our proposed proposal for RET or the Northern Ireland route, uh, and we maintain local government funding support for inter-island services. The significant increase in port and vessel capital in 2018-19 uh, secured the ownership of three Ropax vessels that served the Northern Isles. In 2019-20, we will continue to provide loan support to fund the construction of two dual fuel vessels at Ferguson's on the Clyde and invest in our piers and harbours. 2019 will be a milestone year for digital connectivity in Scotland. Not only will it continue, we will continue to deploy digital infrastructure right across the country through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, we will also award contracts for the Reaching 100 programme and will continue to improve physical connectivity, journey times and connections. Uh, maintaining our commitment to invest £80 million in encouraging a greater shift towards active travel by helping to create high-quality walking and cycling infrastructure. And will continue to provide concessionary travel for older and disabled people and supporting bus services, uh, the use of greener, less pollutant vehicles and smarter ticketing. And there's also a significant uplift in capital investment for Scottish canals and Highlands and Islands airports. We'll continue to uh, make significant investment in Scotland's railways through the rolling uh, programme of electrification, the redeployment, re sorry, redevelopment of uh, Glasgow Queen Street Station and improvements to routes between Aberdeen, Inverness and Inverness and Perth. And we're tackling overcrowding on Scotland's railways with 200 extra carriages to be added to the ScotRail fleet and the introduction of 26 refurbished high-speed trains to operate on intercity routes with 40% more seats. And the rollout of a new sleeper rolling stock will also deliver a step change in overnight rail travel for passengers. Convener, the 2019-20 budget for transport infrastructure and connectivity supports development of a more inclusive, sustainable economy for Scotland. <laughs> Very close, Cabinet Secretary, to, to, to testing my, my timing ability. I thank you for your opening statement. Uh, John, I think yours is the first question, John. Thank John you, Camina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Panel. Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to ask you about ferries, please. And we, we're grateful the committee received a very detailed response from uh, Mr Wheelhouse about uh, our examination of the, the, the ferries. And uh, one of the points he makes is that the new vessels, 801 and 802, and I quote here, their introduction into service to provide additional uh, capacity and resilience um, is what he mentions there. Now, there is in the budget a £4 million resilience fund. Can you say uh, what it will be used for and whether you consider it will be sufficient for the purpose uh, of in improving uh, operations, please? 
Convener, the purpose of the Resilience Fund, the Ferry Resilience Fund, is to uh, provide a, a level resource to allow uh, CalMAC to be able to invest in uh, key components which they know could have an impact on uh, performance of their vessels. So, for example, where they have, uh, in, uh, with the age of the fleet, uh, areas of equipment that may require to be replaced, uh, that they can undertake that work at an earlier stage, which reduces the risk of them having difficulties, uh, whether it be mechanical or electronically, with the, the vessel that can then have an impact on uh, the ability for it to be in service. So it's a, it's a, it's a resource over and above their normal maintenance budget uh, that allows them to invest in some specific investments into vessels or to hold in stock um, uh, equipment which they can use uh, very quickly if it needs to be replaced uh, to minimise the disruption it may cause if there's a mechanical problem. Well, okay, thank you for that. Um, the Northern Isles inter-islands ferries also have ageing fleets with, with significant challenges. I presume that fund can be used for that, and if not, will you consider making funds available for the inter-island ferries in the north? Well, we do make funding available, and it's through the local government settlement. So there's about just over £10 million is provided to both uh, between uh, Orkney Isles and uh, Shetland Isles councils to, uh, to maintain and continue to provide inter-island services. Uh, uh, those vessels are in the ownership of um, uh, those respective uh, councils. It, it would be for them to decide on how they then want to use the money which we allocate through the local government settlement. Uh, uh, to uh, whether it's for maintenance or other purposes on those particular vessels. So we do provide money to the councils for that purpose. But uh, Sorry, I, I thought you nodded when I, I said they too have an ageing fleet, some of which that fleet is not DDA compliant. W would you be interested in taking over that fleet and giving it some resilience? So taking over the fleet or... Yeah. Uh, so uh, well, at this stage, what we've said to the, the councils is that we're prepared to look at... Uh, the possibility of doing so on the basis that, the, that there would be no financial detriment to, uh, to the Scottish Government uh, and also that there is a clear line of replacement around these particular vessels. That was an undertaking which was in the, uh, which was in the, the present ferry plan. Um, as it stands, that work has not been taken forward to the level of detail it would be necessary for, for us to be able to do that. Uh, however, um, my general view is that uh, uh, I think having inter-island services uh, managed and provided by those respective local authorities um, gives them a level of control over how those services are managed and provided within those uh, local areas. Uh, but we uh, will continue to have discussions with them on that, uh, but there's no plans in the immediate future for us to take over the inter-island ferries. Okay, just very briefly then, would you, you, you therefore think the situation with the, the Western Isles, uh, Cornyn and Elshar, the, 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 they're not operating their fleet. Is that anomalous? No. Uh, so there is, a, uh, for example, there are uh, ferries which are operated by Highland Council. Uh, and there's also ferries which are operated by Argyll and Butte Council uh, on a couple of particular routes as well. So it's not just, uh, it's just, not just Orkney and Shetland that have uh, fleets which they operate. O okay, if, if I may uh, change tack... Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, w w in front of us here we have a, t a table among our briefing papers and it's the level two spending plans. Okay. Um, uh, and it, it's a table that lays out that the, there's, there's been increases, albeit modest, in a number of uh, um, the, the lines. The line I'm interested in is air services, where it, it appears to have gone up from 59.8 million to 67.7. Now, I was reading my sums a wee minute ago, and that appears to me to be an increase of about 12 per cent, perhaps more. Why is there that increase? So, um, there is an increase uh, uh, in the allocation of the resource grant for Highlands and Islands airports. Um, uh, that reflects uh, uh, a, a, a additional funding which relates to increase in pay. Uh, pensions and operational uh, cost pressures. Uh, there's also uh, an increase in capital investment, uh, which is required for, uh, for uh, regulatory authorities uh, and to maintain their asset base, so it supports additional capital investment uh, into uh, structures and facilities that they need to make sure they're providing to meet the regulatory requirements uh, through the Civil Aviation Authority, etc., uh, and also to allow them to make further investments in their own airports. 
That's, that's a significant increase, isn't it? It is. Would you be able to provide uh, a breakdown to the committee of what that increase is expected to, to uh, cover in, in more detail than you have there, perhaps? More, more than happy to do that. Yeah. Okay, many thanks yeah. indeed. Th Thank that you. would be something that would be submitted in writing to the committee. It would, would yeah. be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Jamie, did you want to come in on, on the issue of ferries? Thank you, uh, Camille, I appreciate that. And uh, good morning to the panel and to the uh, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just uh, clarify, this is budget scrutiny, so I'll try and stick to numbers uh, as opposed to the politics around the, this. Um, can I just clarify that, according to my papers, of your £2.6 billion transport budget, only £14 million is allocated towards new vessels. And is that an existing contract or for new new vessels? You referred to uh, vessels uh, 801 and 802? If that's what that money is allocated to, yes. It, it will be, yes. So is it correct in saying that in the forthcoming budget year there is uh, no other investment in new vessels, is that correct? Uh, the, uh, as you'll recall, when I was here in December, um, one of the things I said we were doing was we were taking a stock take on our existing procurement arrangements for vessels uh, and also our existing fleet in order to review how that's all been taken forward with a view to bringing forward a much more, what I'd like to see, a much more comprehensive plan that would look at the uh, uh, future plan for ferry investment uh, and how we would then set out a timeline and how that would be taken forward. Uh, part to give greater transparency around that, but also to uh, help to assist the industry in knowing where the government's procurement arrangements will actually be and that work has been undertaken just now. I would hope that to be completed in the first part of this year, uh, uh, the first half of this year. Um, but that's why we're now taking that work forward in order to make sure we've got a clearer line of sight around what that investment will look like in the years ahead. OK, and, and that is very welcome. I think a long-term strategy is something that the committee yeah. said would, would, would be helpful uh, in terms of ferry procurement. But it's fair to say there is no new additional money in, in your budget for new vessels being allocated in the next f financial year. That's just an observation that I'm making. It, no, no, no additional vessels okay. at the present time. So on, on the 14.2 million that's here, if you add that on top of the 59.18 from last year, I, I make that 73 million. Is that the estimated cost of Hulls 801 or 802? If so, what is the total estimated cost of the build of the current vessels that have been commissioned? And does that include or exclude the uh, already uh, known overruns? And if it doesn't include those overruns, has the government built in any uh, potential contingency uh, for the uh, cost, if it is found to be liable for those overruns. Okay, I, I'll ask uh, I'll ask Mike to respond to the, the, the specific detail <coughs> in terms of these particular uh, these particular um, uh, vessels. Um, on the issue of um, uh, is there a, a finance in there to deal with any claim, um, uh, you will recognise that it is only a claim, uh, <coughs> and any claim, if it was successful, would have to be considered at that particular point. Um, <coughs> What I'm not going to do is have in a budget uh, a provision for a claim on the basis that we are accepting that that claim is correct. Uh, and as you're aware, Ferguson's have lodged a claim with CMAL, and that's presently being assessed by CMAL. And we'll be given due consideration in the, in the months ahead. But it's a substantial amount of money. I mean, we're talking up to 30, 40 million pounds plus. So, I, I, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's not an insignificant number, uh, Cabinet Secretary. No, it's not an insignificant number, but um, I'm not starting on the premise that we just accept that number from them in the first place. Okay. And the total cost? Um, so the, the cumulative provision for 801 and 802 is 97 million uh, over a number of years, which reflects the contract value. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you wanted to come in. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at the same uh, level two. Rail services, we've come in for quite a lot of criticism in regard to rail services over the last couple of months, but I see that the budget actually from 2018-19 to 2019-20 is going up £181 million. Pounds. In fact, near enough rail services are going to have a budget next year of nearly a billion pounds, £11 million pounds short of a billion pounds. Is that basically to fund all the new items that the Cabinet Secretary you detailed earlier? Well, uh, the, the increase, for example, is part to do with the delivery of the uh, new sleepers uh, as well. Uh, it's also um, uh, part to uh, pick up some of the, the capital costs which are associated with it. 
Some of the increase is also a reflection in the change in the way in which funding has been provided to rail. Now, uh, Mike can explain there have been some technical changes made, so uh, in making it grant funding instead, uh, which is reflected in his budget line. But overall, it reflects the fact that, uh, as a government, investment in our rail services continues to be a key priority for us. A major investment. Uh, a very significant investment. Uh, and a very significant investment being taken forward over a number of years now. Um, uh, uh, but that investment will be continuing in this budget uh, uh, as well as it stands at the present time. But I'll ask Mike maybe just to explain the technical change that's happened here around um, uh, some aspects of rail funding, particularly for network rail. Okay. Um, so from uh, in the previous five years, uh, the funding of Network Rail has been done through uh, UK Treasury and debt funding, what's known as a regulated asset base. Uh, from 1st of April 2019, uh, the arrangements for funding of Network Rail change across the UK, and that will be done by way of a direct grant from uh, Scottish ministers to uh, Network Rail. There have been negotiations with HM Treasury over the last number of years around what that settlement should be for the five-year period commencing 1st of April 2019. And the, the budget that we have reflects the drawdown uh, or the phase drawdown of that settlement in the first of those five years. So there's been a change in the basis of funding, so it'll be a cash grant effectively to Network Rail to support operations, maintenance and renewals, as well as any enhancement projects uh, that, that pertain, um, and those will be a combination, those enhancement projects will be a, a combination of the flow through from the current control period, so Queen Street has been mentioned, uh, but also new uh, planning for new developments to take place in control period six. So we're giving money to Network Rail, but we don't control them? That's correct. Thank you. Um, we seem to have gone, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, slightly off track. We were on ferries at the moment and have gone on to railways. Richard, I'm going to let John come in on railways and then I'm going to definitely go back to ferries because there are quite a lot of questions on it. John, if you want to come I'm in on I'm grateful, rails. Convener. It's on the very specific point raised by Mr Lyle. Cabinet Secretary, there was last year a dispute about the, the formula by which money came to, to Scotland from Network Rail. Are you able to advise has that been resolved? Because there was a shortcoming, a shortfall in the monies that we were due. There's still a difference. I think there's still a difference in this matter. And I'll, I'll uh, let Mike uh, back to respond. So, to that. Scottish ministers put forward um, their views on the basis of the allocation, um, which uh, does not agree with, with what Treasury have, have allocated. Uh, the funding that we'll receive is what Treasury have, have allocated, so that issue is still unresolved. But you can confirm that it was a changed formula that was applied by, uh, by the Treasury that sold Scotland short on that? That's correct. Thank you. Part of, part of this is tied into what we believe has been a historical underinvestment within okay. Scottish rail infrastructure, which we're now having to try to catch up with. Thank you. Right, Cabinet Secretary, we're going back to ferries. OK. Because we haven't finished there yet. John. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I understand uh, there's a project to build a hydrogen-powered ferry which potentially would be used in Orkney. Uh, can you give us any update on that? And I'm, I'm not quite sure where, how much money the Scottish Government's putting into that or if it's other partners that are putting the money in. Uh, well, we've been supporting the High Seas uh, programme through both Transport Scotland and also through um, at Scottish Enterprise. Uh, it's now been led uh, by Ferguson Marine uh, Engineering Limited. Uh, they've also secured uh, some £9 million from the European Union uh, to help to develop what will be a, uh, the development of, a, uh, as you're aware, it's a, a hydrogen-based uh, drive chain uh, for a drive train for a vessel. Uh, they're at the point where they uh, in, expect to uh, undertake some of their initial uh, storyline work uh, 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 later this year, with the view to being uh, ready for a vessel at some point uh, late into 2020. Um, my personal view is that I think it's a very ambitious timeline uh, that they have for this particular project, uh, but we have been supporting it through the uh, through both Transport Scotland and through uh, Scottish Enterprise to date. Uh, I mean, very encouraged. I'm very enthusiastic about hydrogen uh, as a potential fuel, so that's great. I mean, do Ferguson definitely have the capacity, and I'm uh, including physical capacity, because we've visited their site and it's not huge, if they've still got the two current vessels, the dual fuel ones being built, and the hydrogen one, is that is that really going to work? Depends on the vessel size. 
So, and that hasn't been finalised yet. So, it depends on the vessel size that the uh, uh, that is uh, that's procured for the purpose of this particular. So for an inter-island ferry, uh, uh, so it will be a smaller vessel, uh, but it depends on the actual size and the complexity of that vessel as to their capacity to be able to deal with that. And are the two they're building at the moment still on time uh, for what we were told was the time scale? I think one was due to be launched this summer, or sorry, one was due to be ready this summer. So Ferguson's are still stating that that's the timelines which they are working to. Uh, we've got independent um, uh, uh, advisors uh, monitoring progress uh, on their work uh, in this area, but that's the timeline which Ferguson still say that they can deliver these two ferries to uh, 801 and 802 in, uh, at the present time. Do you believe them? Uh, I think it remains a challenging timeline for them to meet. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think the next question is mine, although some of it has been answered. Um, you, you will no doubt have, when you took over the portfolio, looked at the Scottish Ferry Services Ferry Plan 2013 to 2022, which would have based all your predictions on the uh, future of procurement. And if you turn to page 14, if you had it, you would see it says, we will replace vessels according to their life expiry and will base investment decisions on an analysis of whole life costs and benefits with the objective of covering as far as cost possible capital costs by savings in operating costs and increasing in revenue. Well, that is a truly ambitious target, which I would suggest is completely unachievable if you're going to save, you know, if it's costing £97 million pounds, uh, for two ferries. So just go back. We've got, I looked at three ferries, the Isle of Arran, Isle of Cumbrae and the Lord of the Isles, all over 30 years old, all with more than seven faults last year that took them out, some of them extremely expensive to repair. You, you my question is, is surely this ferries plan, which was the basis of the government's future procurement, should have allowed for some replacement vehicles to already been purchased and identified for this year over and above 801 and 802 uh, to replace some of these vehicles, uh, vessels which 801 and 802 won't do. So, so what's happened to that investment? Well, look, I think it's, it, it's more to recognise there has been significant investment in both the ferries and harbours um, over the last 10 plus years. Uh, however, uh, meeting some of these capital costs associated with investment in uh, it matters such as ferries and also harbours and ports um, is, is costly uh, and we've had to try and manage that uh, within very, very strict budget constraints, uh, which has had a direct impact on a whole range of uh, uh, investment opportunities and choices. So there's no doubt that the uh, financial limitations which we've had with cuts in our budget in recent years um, have had a direct impact on some of these decisions and the ability to make some of that forward investment. What I want to do, though, is um, I want to have a clear, as I mentioned earlier on, a clear line of sight around our replacement programme, so the, both the deployment and replacement programme, uh, uh, going forward and how that will look uh, like in terms of new procurement uh, arrangements. Uh, and that's exactly why we're taking forward the review uh, at this particular time in looking at both deployment and procurement, uh, and that will also then tie into uh, our investment plan going forward. And that work that we take over the coming months will help to inform that future direction. I, I hope it's not going to be based on the principle of, of basing the cost savings or what you can buy on the cost savings that you'll achieve. But a, a, a question for you, if, if a ferry came along um, that met the requirements of, of what we need to service the islands, would you still buy it? At the um, right price? At the right price. Uh, I think if there was a, a, a one-off opportunity for us to procure a ferry uh, that could uh, serve the network, uh, yes, we would look at that very seriously. And in fairness, CMAL are actively uh, looking at the present time uh, as to any ferries that come onto the market that potentially could be brought into uh, the fleet. So if there was an opportunity, that's something that we would give due consideration to. Okay, so my, my question to you is that when the new uh, ferries uh, plan comes out uh, and to replace this one, which is only halfway through its life, will you commit to ensuring that the work that's identified in there will be financed in, in forthcoming budgets to deliver 
those aspirations in that ferry plan? Well, it depends on future budget decisions, but the purpose behind carrying out this work is so that we have a clearer line of sight and a clear plan around what those investments should look like uh, to inform our decision making around these matters. Uh, so the intention would be to, uh, uh, to try and achieve that in a more effective way than we have at the present moment. Um, uh, but clearly that depends on uh, future budget arrangements within government overall. Okay. Jamie, the next question is yours. Um, thank you, convener. I mean, I mean overall, uh, you will have uh, read our uh, letter or, uh, around our concerns over the fact, as the convener alluded to, that many of these vessels are reaching the end of their lifespan. Many island communities have been uh, let down hugely over uh, uh, vessels going offline, technical issues, finding it difficult to replace parts, etc. I appreciate you talked about your four million pound resilience fund, but uh, that's not replacing vessels, and nor is it replacing uh, some of these uh, very uh, old vessels. What reassurances can you give today to the committee, but also the wider public, um, that uh, reliability and punctuali punctuality will improve, uh, given that your budget uh, has no new investment in new vessels? Well, let's look at it. Um, uh, well, it's wrong to say it doesn't have... We've got investment going into the uh, 801 and 802 at the present time. Which uh, you've just you're said will probably to not be delivered that. on time, to be and What fair, we are so. doing is that, for example, the Isle of Ferries, the next ferry, we'll be looking to replace work around uh, looking at both design and procurement of that has already started. So um, it's not as though nothing is happening uh, in that sense. Uh, let me just pick up on the issue about... Um, uh, punctuality and reliability. Uh, the statistics from CalMAC uh, in their uh, report show reliability is around 97% and punctuality is around 96%. Now, we would always want to see that improve, um, but they are uh, very impressive figures. But I also recognise that when you are uh, trying to get to an island, when uh, a ferry is cancelled uh, for whatever reason, uh, if it's weather-related or mechanical-related, that can be extremely inconvenient. And it has a particular impact on those who live in our island communities because they are so dependent and reliant upon them. Uh, and what we have had at times is that we have had some vessels in particular routes that may have had a greater number of reliability issues than that within uh, the rest of the actual uh, fleet, which is what the Resilience Fund is about trying to help to support so they can do some forward planning in that, so they can have some of the spares that very often if it goes, uh, it's not held in stock. It's something that actually has to be manufactured, so it allows CalMAC to look at particular items that they can get manufactured now, hold in stock, because they know if mechanically they lose that, it could be quite a bit of time before they can get it. So it's all about trying to help to support that type of, uh, type of issue and to try to help to reduce the, the inconvenience and the difficulty that's caused when uh, mechanical difficulties do occur. Um, so uh, reliability uh, and punctuality uh, figures from Caledonia McBrain are impressive, but we would always want to see them improving on that. And the Resilience Fund is a specific fund to try to help to support them in making sure that they have to hand some of the, the mechanical things that they will require uh, to help to improve viability in particular. Uh, punctuality is 0% if the ferry doesn't run at all, uh, and that's what many people are actually facing, and that's the problem here. If you look at the time scales of what's, what could happen next, we have a budget year coming up where there's no, no investment in new ferries, I appreciate there's a bigger piece of there work. There is investment in new ferries. Two new ferries right now. Well, there, there's a small line in the budget to, to finish yeah, that's the cost too, of the ferries which haven't been delivered. Yeah, but you can't, say there's no, you can't say there's no investment in new ferries okay. when there is investment in new ferries. There's £14 million pounds out of nearly £3 billion. Pounds. That's a significant okay. amount of money. Uh, for an existing contract. No new contracts. That's my point. The second point I want to make is... Even if your strategic review says, here's the plan, we're going to commission new ferries of the following sorts, knowing how long it takes to build ferries, knowing the difficulties and complexities that you come up against, especially when engaging in new technologies, as we've seen with the late delivery of the two new ferries which haven't been delivered into the network, and the problems that causes, realistically, how many years down the line is it before we will see new vessels? And what happens to this ageing fleet in the meantime when there are more and more breakdowns and cancel services. And can you understand people's perception that this is a, a, a looming problem for us if there are no new vessels being commissioned 
other than the two which are light, yet an ageing fleet that we have in these continuous problems. The two don't marry up. Why aren't we making these decisions sooner? Okay. Well, I think, first of all, your point that many people are experiencing this idea of um, uh, a, a, their experience of cancellations. I've just given you the figure. 97 per cent is the reliability figure uh, within the network at the present time. Uh, punctuality is at 96 per cent. Now, what I accept is that when there is a cancellation or ferries are running late, it has an impact on people. Uh, uh, which can uh, be very significant. So I'm not saying that there, is a, uh, there are not challenges around punctuality and reliability, but I do think the facts of the statistics that are being provided by Caledon McBrain do demonstrate a very good level of reliability and punctuality. But there is a risk with an ageing fleet that, you, uh, that issues around reliability could become an increasing problem. And for some of the vessels, that has been the case. So in order to address that, we've created the Resilience Fund, which is there to help to support them and be able to make sure that anything that they have in terms of whether it be electronic uh, technology that they need to upgrade, that they're in a position where they can actually do that out with their normal maintenance programme, and that they can also hold to stock items that they may require, uh, which if they were fail, which fail, would be critical to the operation of the vessel, that they can have it to hand to allow it to be, to be repaired much more quickly to get the vessel back in use as quickly as possible. We've got two new vessels uh, which, are, uh, which, are called, uh, which are in uh, construction at the present time. We are looking at the replacement of the Isla Ferry, so uh, some of the uh, uh, design uh, and uh, works that will be necessary for that to go to procurement are already been taken forward. Uh, we are looking at, as I've already mentioned, uh, the whole procurement approach that we have alongside the replacement programme that we will require uh, for vessels and also for harbours and ports, which are critical as well, which we will take forward. If your view is that the level of allocation of funding within the budget uh, for ferries is insufficient I'd be interested in hearing what the committee's views are on which other part of the budget should be cut in order to allocate it to ferries. I can hear people saying to me that they want to see an increase in a particular budget line, but they also have the responsibility to identify where they want that money to come Cap from. Cap Cabinet Secretary, I, I think it's an interesting point, but that's asking the, this committee to do the work of every other committee in the Parliament as far as budget scrutiny is concerned. So I, I, I think that's a bit of a difficult question to ask. <coughs> Jamie, have you, uh, if, if you've got your answer, I'd like to move on to Peter Chapman's answer. Yep. Um, uh, question, sorry. When, when, when you, we know that there's been huge pressures on the ferries, particularly during the summer with increased tourism, and, and that's fine, but it has meant that sometimes locals uh, have been unable to get a ticket to get off the island at short notice. And there has been some talk about consideration of demand management measures to help alleviate pressure at peak times. Does this mean, or are you thinking that this might mean higher fares at, at peak times, or if that's not your you're thinking, what, what is your thinking to try and manage this huge pressure at, uh, at peak times? Well, it was, a, it was an option that set out within the ferry plan, looking at the possibility of trying to manage demand, particularly where uh, in routes that have got RET in place and the demand that's increased in these particular routes. Um, what we've said is that that allows us to look at a number of different options. So, for example, um, um, it could be the option of higher fares at peak times, or it could be the option of incentives at off-peak times, where there's capacity on the actual ferry. Is there a way in which we can actually try to shift some of that demand uh, to utilise the resource much more effectively? So there's a variety of different things we can look at there to try and help to uh, deal with some of the, uh, the additional demand. One of the things I think is particularly important here is that um, it, it's not something that may be necessary in every route. It may be just in some specific routes at specific times there's a need for some sort of demand management arrangements to be put in place. Uh, so anything around this will be looked at on that basis. Uh, but in doing that, um, I'm also very clear about the need to make sure we engage with the local community, uh, both at an individual level and also for local businesses, uh, around any demand management arrangements which are put in place. Uh, so if we are looking at doing that in any particular routes, there will be engagement within the local community around that. And any demand management arrangements that are put in place will be put in place with agreement of the local community uh, and what we're trying to achieve. 
uh, uh, through that. So, so there's a variety of different options uh, uh, that we can look at, but it will be a process which will be uh, uh, through engagement with local communities and how we can make sure we're utilising the resources as best we can. I mean, that's fine, and I welcome what you've just said, but does that mean that there will be some schemes in place that this summer, for instance? Because, you know, it is a, it is a summertime issue. Uh, so we, we, I'm not sure whether in, in evidence, uh, would you call, uh, if it's in the letter or not, one of the things that we're taking forward is an action plan around looking at things, for example, we know there are specific issues for uh, those who live in our islands, been able to go off the islands for uh, medical appointments or funerals, etc. Um, and one of the things that Paul Wheelhouse has been taking forward with, uh, with officials is looking at putting in place some form of arrangement that tries to help to address some of these types of issues uh, through the form of an action plan. Um, we would like to see that in place, if possible, for this season. Um, it's a challenging time frame for us, um, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's possible in some of the work that's been taken forward is to, try to, help to, uh, to try to help to achieve that. I'll ask maybe Francis maybe to, to, say, to say a wee bit more about that and the work that we're taking forward. The plan is um, intended to look, recognising there are long-term replacement issues. The, the action plan is intended to look at short-term customer experience and what we can do to ameliorate the impact of delays when those do unfortunately arise or they're unavoidable. So part of that will be about how can we encourage operators to more effectively communicate delays, to more effectively communicate contingency arrangements and to better articulate what steps they have undertaken in deciding what those contingency measures should be. So that's um, some kind of practical things around what information they have on their website about looking at alternative vessel deployment, looking at exploring additional sailings and where there are impediments to those preferred options, explaining to passengers why they can't be delivered in their particular circumstances circumstances which prevail. The second thing that it looks at is uh, more practical measures. What can operators or passengers do um, to mitigate the impact? Who's responsible, for example, for providing alternative accommodation or alternative routes and just, just kind of practical help in that manner? And part of it will include looking at demand measure or demand management responses. I think it will be challenging to answer the specific question to have that conversation because we do need to do that in consultation with communities, with all communities by this summer. But certainly it's one of the, the kind of key priorities that we have coming into the new season to, to finalise that and make sure that it is well articulated, people are aware of it and that it meets the demand that's, that's been, been put to us. Okay, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you. I, um, fortunately, I don't know of having any friends at all in the noon. Um, Calmac uh, have uh, a great reputation for providing lifeline services, uh, but on the Guruk Danun crossing, 85% plus of the traffic chooses to go on a commercial operator that runs a very successful service. Why have we got a second service that we are subsidising and which the Audit Scotland uh, tells us will require substantial investment in new vessels? Well, look, um, we've, uh, you'll be aware of a recent decision we made on um, uh, deciding that the uh, Guruk to Danun ferry service that's uh, moved into the, uh, uh, the Clyde Hebridean uh, service uh, will be a passenger only service going forward, um, largely because if you look at the uh, potential usage of that route uh, for vehicle uh, use, um, uh, the market space is very, very small. It's just not sustainable um, as a service. Uh, and uh, 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 Paul Wheelhouse and myself came to the view that uh, we should make a decision get, which gives us clarity around how we can take this particular service forward. So um, uh, we still see it as an important service uh, to the community that stay in, in Dunoon uh, and be able to access uh, at Guruk and on to uh, the rest of the central belt. Uh, and we want to maintain that service going forward. Um, what will happen is the existing vessel will continue to uh, operate on that particular route. Uh, what we will now be able to do, having made this decision, is that we'll now be able to consider what uh, any future vessel for that particular route may look like uh, uh, in the replacement programme uh, going forward. Uh, and I'll also allow Seamal, uh, uh, who own the uh, Guruk uh, port uh, harbour, uh, that allows them to now decide on what investment programme they take forward for investment as well. So 
We see it to be important uh, to providing that additional link uh, for uh, communities in the, uh, the Dunoon area, uh, but in deciding to make it a passenger-only service going forward, it allows us now to get clarity around investment in both vessel and also in the harbour infrastructure. Uh, so, in, in terms of the numbers that uh, I've got in front of me for potential new vessels to support that, which are very, very substantial indeed, and I seem to recall that 10 years ago, the subsidy that was being given to carry passengers on what is now a CalMac route exceeded the fare that the commercial operator was charging, and it never seemed to make any sense to have essentially two crossings on the same stretch of water. Uh, especially as the sea crossing uh, that Carmack operates is 50% longer in steaming terms than the one that the commercial operator runs. Mm. Um, I'll ask Mike maybe just to comment, on, or Francis to comment on the history of it, uh, uh, of it uh, as, a, as a particular crossing. Uh, my view in terms of resilience for that particular community in providing them with um, uh, the additional crossing that we, we have from Guruk to Dunan, I think, is important, and we want to maintain that and continue with that going forward. Um, uh, there are many routes uh, that we, uh, would you call it, that uh, present financial challenges and sustainability. Um, this is not the only route where there are financial challenges and its sustainability, uh, but given their importance to those local communities, and particularly for those where it may be the only lifeline they've got, then we have to maintain them and to continue with them. Uh, but I think having an additional passenger service there is a, it continues to be important. Uh, we've now got clarity on how that will operate going forward in the future, and we can now make the decisions that allow us to improve that service, uh, both in terms of ferry and also in terms of harbour, harbour infrastructure uh, and what it will look like going forward. I don't know where our mic or... Sorry, I'm Secretary. In, in, uh, sorry, just in the interest of managing the way forward looking too far back into history may may not allow us to get to through all the questions of the present so um if, if there was a very short answer a, a, a 30 second potted history if not there are still further questions on this this thing that i'd like to look at so we can move on i think there's a long history to this so i don't think it will be a short answer but if the member would like further information on it I'd be more than happy to to respond to him in writing on that matter Okay, I, I think I think that 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 would be helpful in writing, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there's a, there's a series of questions here. Jamie Green, followed by Colin, followed by uh, John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, local ferry users on both sides of the Clyde were uh, uh, understandably dismayed that there was a tender that was then paused. Then the tender was back on, and now it's been cancelled altogether. Can you just advise why you've decided to direct award that contract and on which? on the basis of which legal advice that you didn't have to go to tender for it. And given that you have direct awarded it to uh, an operator, um, can you put a timescale uh, for the benefit of uh, users of that service, bearing in mind it's one of the lesser resilient services, if a new vessel will be put in place, and if so, when? So just as I've mentioned there, um, now we've got clarity and it will be a passenger-only service that allows us now to consider what any replacement vessel could look like, what it would be, so that will be part of our plan going forward, or procurement and deployment plan going forward, uh, and also investment into the uh, into the harbour um, at Guruk in particular, uh, can, now, uh, uh, can now be considered by CMAL as part of their investment programme, which they're already doing in looking at what that should, uh, what that should look like. Um, I'll get uh, Francis to say a bit more about the decision around uh, the matter. Um, as you're aware, this was a standalone uh, contract um, uh, out with the Clyde and Hebedean service and our view was that continuing to have it as a, a passenger only service out with that particular contract uh, didn't make any logical sense um, it would it was better to actually draw into the uh, the overall Clyde and Hebridean uh, contract uh, and that's the approach which we've taken the last Francis maybe to say a bit more but um, it clearly legal advice was taken on uh, uh, on our ability to do that think i'm sorry to keep interrupting i apologize but there are a lot of questions actually on specifically on budget things so i'm very happy if that legal advice and and that wants to be given in writing to the committee if the committee members happy to do that so we can move on to the questions relating particularly to the budget scrutiny cabinet secretary are you content that I'm, I'm happy to do that if, if, if yeah. mr Green's happy okay. with that yeah. thank you so i'm going to take john finney actually next up because it's on this subject then i'm going to go to colin and then mike rumbles 
I'll say it and then you'll give me a row convener. But I wonder, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and, and applaud the approach you've taken, it recognises that transport isn't always about uh, motor vehicles. And whilst the other service does provide uh, a passenger service, the link direct into the town is complemented by the fact that when people come off on the south side, they can go directly into a train and connect elsewhere. Is that a factor? That it is a factor, and one of the things we've also given a commitment to do is to look at well as a way in which we could help to improve connectivity from the from the harbour. So, for example, looking at the possibility of um, uh, a car club arrangement uh, with electric vehicles uh, well, that might help to support it, people. No, but it just helps support people who maybe come off where there's no cars there. Yeah. But uh, would you call, um, uh, and particularly given that they are electric vehicles, I'm sure the member would welcome that. Neatly done, Mr. Finney. Um, and Colin, yours is the next question. That's convenient. Please to know um, it's not a question on ferries. Um, it's a very brief um, question on uh, bus services uh, and a change in the, the, the budget uh, around that. Last year, uh, the budget included um, £10 million of financial uh, transaction loan facilities uh, for the, the, the bus industry, which ultimately wasn't, wasn't drawn down. Uh, and this year, that's been replaced by £3 million in, in direct capital funding. Uh, which means the overall budget line for the, the level of support for bus services falls from 64.2 million to, to 57.2 million. C can you explain why the, the, the 10 million pound loan facilities wasn't used last year? What was, what was the reasons behind that? Because obviously it's a, a service, a facility that was provided, but ultimately not, not drawn down and not used for the benefit of improving bus services. Yeah, so we, we looked at it being utilised by the industry as a, as a loan fund for them to be able to um, uh, to be able to uh, used for the purchase of buses um, uh, and in the end the industry uh, chose not to use it. Um, largely I understand on the basis that they could get as good a deal within the commercial market uh, as they could from, uh, uh, from this particular arrangement. You'll also be aware that our access to financial transaction arrangements like this varies from year to year depending on the Treasury uh, and their arrangements around these issues. But it was large that the industry didn't feel as though that it offered them anything over and above what they could actually get access through the commercial markets. Okay. Thank you. And uh, another non-ferry question. Mike. Yeah. My question is on Prestwick Airport. Um, I'm aware that another loan, yet another loan has gone to Prestwick Airport and I was wondering whether in the future budget, uh, you have any more plans to make any more loans to Prestwick Airport? And therefore, can you tell us how much money um, Prestwick Airport owes the Scottish Government? And does he think, can he give me an indication of what year we'll ever get our money back? Okay. Um, so the, within this financial year's budget, um, we have a this draft budget, we have allocated just over £7 million um, of loans, which... Uh, which Presswick Airport can draw down upon, uh, which are on a commercial basis and on commercial terms. Um, as it stands at the present moment, is it about 40, 46. £46 million pounds that they have, uh, they have drawn down on uh, loans to date, and this gives them an additional £7 million. Pounds. Um, you'll be aware that they recently published their accounts um, uh, just before Christmas, uh, which demonstrate that um, uh, costs are down, revenue is up, um, that continues to be the pattern uh, in this financial year as well, is that their costs are continuing to decrease and their revenues are increasing as well. Uh, as a consequence, the drawdown which they made in the last financial year was slightly down on what it had been the previous years um, as it will. Uh, our investment in, uh, in making these loans available to Presswick is a recognition of the importance that this strategic asset has not just to the local economy, but also to our national economy, given the very significant industries which are associated with Presswick uh, uh, and the aerospace industry. Uh, and in our view, uh, it's important we continue to maintain those, uh, those industries in that particular area, given their important link to, uh, to the airport. Does that so, mean that you don't expect them to pay the money back? You know, these are these are commercial these are commercial loans, uh, so they they have to be repaid on that basis as well. By when? Uh, I can't give you a time frame on that uh, as it stands because uh, Presswick Airport is operating in a very challenging market, uh, particularly when it comes to passenger air services. Uh, you saw that in terms of with Glasgow and Edinburgh Airport, uh, uh, the challenges which are there. You can see it with the situation we have with Flybe as it stands at the present moment. Uh, uh, within, the, within the aviation industry. So there's a very challenging market which we're operating in. What they do have is they have a range of very specialist skills at Presswick Airport. 
uh, which is over and above what other uh, airports are able to provide, particularly around freight, uh, very specialist nature of freight as well, uh, which they're looking to expand and develop. So in their in increasing their um, in increasing their uh, income, that's been a key part for them uh, in moving more and more into that space. The challenge with that particular sector is that it comes in bits and bobs. It doesn't all come in a, a, a standard uh, a line that you know in the next three years you always have uh, X amount coming in. It, it goes up and down. So you have to pursue individual contracts. So it's a challenging environment for them. Uh, uh, but we should not underestimate the importance that Presswick has to the wider economy, and particularly the businesses which are associated with the airport. But that's my, that's my precise point, because if you look at the profitability of the company, they're not profitable. They, they don't... Of the, of the last 10 years, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like one year they've been profitable. They're not profitable at the moment. They have no chance of becoming profitable, from I can see from the books. And I get from that your response is that you're indicating how much more important it is for the larger, wider economy, and I'm not disputing that with you, but what I'm trying to get at is looking at it from a financial point of view and from a budgetary point of view. If that is a higher consideration than your consideration of paying the taxpayers' money back, um, do we have any prospect of getting that taxpayers' money back. That's a, I'm asking that that's a political decision. That you Are you making a political decision that is far more important to have it a, for general health, if I can put it that way, rather than focus on getting the, the money that we've invested in there back? Well, look, we, 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 would, we would like to see um, uh, the airport at some point being back in uh, private ownership. Um, that's dependent on the market and interest in the actual uh, airport itself. Um, in the meantime, uh, and as you're aware, it's operating at arm's length to government on a commercial basis, uh, they have been reducing their cost base uh, and also increasing their revenue in order to reduce uh, the amount of money that they require from government through the loans that they have at the present time. What happens in the future is dependent upon where there is commercial interest actually in taking over the airport and also uh, the scope for the existing management team to draw in additional revenue uh, into uh, Press Week. Uh, and that's something which they are very actively looking at uh, and considering. But the wider point I'm making is that for us to simply walk away from Press Week would have a devastating impact um, on the regional economy uh, and the businesses which are closely associated with uh, Press Week Airport in the aviation industry. And as a, a, as a government, we're not prepared just to walk away from that. So, yes, we need to find a long-term solution, uh, uh, and we're continuing to try to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, the management team are doing what they can to reduce their cost base and also to increase their revenues. Uh, uh, and they'll continue to do that from the discussions I've had with them going forward. I'm going to have to take Richard's question. Uh, well, basically, I've, I've described press with as the jewel in the crown. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much loans we're giving them. It is a substantial asset, which is, uh, again, is a major employer in the Ayrshire uh, area. So I have no concerns about how much money you're giving every year. And quite honestly, I think it'll be years before <coughs> they'll be able to, to do it. But it's, um, would you agree with me it's a substantial asset? Uh, that it's uh, basically it's a jewel in the crown. I, I Great. It's, it's a very important national asset, and it's extremely important to the, the regional and the national economy, uh, and we shouldn't underestimate that. Can I just ask a, 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 a question based on that you said they are commercial loans um, to Presswick Airport? On, on my understanding, um, you said they've, they've had 42 million already. They've got the ability to draw down another 7 million, 49 million you will have had a valuation of the asset carried out last year in preparation for the accounts. I understand the importance absolutely of the airport to the local economy, but on an open market valuation of the airport, could you confirm to me, in order to secure those commercial loans, it is valued at more than £49 million in fixed and tangible assets? OK. I'll ask uh, uh, Michael Francis to respond to that. Uh, in more detail for you? Um, I don't have the, the figures to hand, but I, I'm more than happy to clarify that following the meeting. I very much look forward to receiving the, the valuation as prepared, which you would have had done for the accounts. Thank you for that offer. The next question is from Maureen Watt. Maureen. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, afternoon, panel. 
Um, can we move on to um, digital connectivity? Um, my understanding is that the Digital uh, Scotland Superpass broadband programme should probably have finished by now, but due to the success of the uptake and the reinvestment of that monies, it's continuing um, its rollout. So do you have an idea now of when that might be completed or are you going to let it roll on, if you like? Well, look, uh, the, the DSSB programme has been a very successful programme. The Audit Scotland report demonstrated that. It's actually had a reach beyond what its uh, targets were. Uh, part of the benefit of that is that we have a gain share uh, within the programme, which will allow us to uh, provide um, uh, a, a, a broadband connectivity to some 23,000 uh, additional premises over and above what was initially uh, set. That's been taken forward this year. So it doesn't appear in this budget line because it's already been provided for. Um, uh, and that will, be, uh, that will be taken forward in the course of uh, 2019. And then obviously we're out to procurement just now. It stands at the present time for the R100 programme, which will be the next programme after the DSSB programme. So do you see an end date for the uh, a super fast programme then or not? I don't know. Uh, no, do you mean the DSSB programme? Yeah. It should be completed this year? Yeah, so. I mean, I think we anticipate that by the end of this year, that will kind of be the end of the activity in the ground, certainly by the end of the financial year, and then it's into um, the kind of managed closure of the programme, which will take a period. But, um, but in terms of the deployment on the ground, certainly by the end of this financial year, but most probably by the end of the calendar year. Because I think there's much more that can be done in that. I mean... I've spoken to colleagues and they see the open reach vans in their area, but what's on the website doesn't actually match what is actually happening in terms of connectivity on the ground. So I think the website's behind um, what's actually happening. So there's probably more that can be done on that, but that's just an aside. Um, can you tell me what discussions the Scottish government has had with the UK government to ensure a fair share of the 200 million um, that is uh, available for um, the network, for connectivity network. <coughs> We've had engagement with the UK government on this matter. Uh, the challenge with this is that uh, we weren't consulted on it at the time when the UK government announced it. Uh, so they've designed this programme in a way that isn't particularly helpful for rural Scotland uh, around this idea of using public, uh, 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 public infrastructure as hubs uh, which in our, our more rural communities doesn't work. Uh, had they engaged with it at an earlier stage, we could have actually fed that in, uh, which would have helped the programme to have been designed better to reflect the needs of rural Scotland. However, uh, notwithstanding that, we are working with them, but we haven't got to the point where we have finalised an amount that will be allocated to Scotland through this 200 million uh, programme. Uh, and uh, there is a need for us to get to that particular point, uh, so we've got clarity on that. Um, I would certainly welcome any uh, support from the, the committee in, in, in getting the UK government to give clarity on that, but um, as it stands at the present time, um, I can't give you a figure because that hasn't been finalised, and part of that is because of the design of the programme that doesn't really fit with rural Scotland. And I take it that's separate then from the contribution that we would expect from the UK government on the R100 project, and do we know how much money we can expect from the UK government for the R100 project? The, the, the R100 programme is a, a £600 million programme, uh, which we are taking forward. The contribution from the UK government to the R100 programme is £20.99 million, so it's about 3% of the overall budget. Despite them being responsible for connectivity and broadband yeah but this right. is this is a this is this is a uh, this is a wholly reserved matter mm -hmm. uh, to the UK government the reason we've stepped into this is because of the lack of strategy to provide the right type of digital connectivity in Scotland so we are we're using um, we're using uh, uh, Scottish government money on an area which is wholly reserved to the UK government and it is disappointing that uh, they are only allocating uh, just around 21 million pounds to this this new R100 program. Can we expect any more from the UK government then? Or? Uh, we'll certainly continue to press uh, for them to make a greater contribution to it. And I would certainly welcome the support of the committee in pursuing the UK government on this matter because it, it does feel wholly unacceptable that in such an ambitious programme that we've got here, uh, where we've had to step in because of lack of progress that has been made to provide the right type of digital connectivity, uh, that the UK government's making such a, a, a very little, or such a, 
at what I think is a rather pathetic level of investment in digital infrastructure in Scotland. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I've got a few questions for you. Uh, as, as I understand it, the uh, next phase of R100 will be uh, awarded in three geographical lots, um, and that was to take part in February, I think, which has now been delayed till uh, the summer. Could you just confirm to me which parts or how much of that £28.2 million that is allocated in the budget will be allocated to each of the geographical lots, and what are those geographical lots? So there is um, uh, the three lots are uh, north, central, and south. Uh, the overall R100 programme should uh, provide us with digital con broadband connectivity to uh, in excess of 170,000 premises. Uh, the largest chunk of that is in the north, uh, and then the second largest is in the south, and the smallest amount is within the central element of that. And the, uh, the programme, the procurement programme, is broken into those three lots um, for the industry. So in terms of the, uh, uh, if it would be helpful to give you the figures for each of these three lots, if that would be useful. So for example, in the northern lot, it's in the region of about 90,000 uh, premises. In the central lot, it's around uh, uh, 54,000. Uh, and in the southern slot, it is a uh, 27,000. Uh, thousand. Now, you may be wondering why is it uh, that the uh, budget allocation to the central law is lower than that of the uh, of the southern law, and it's largely because of the engineering that's required uh, in these rural areas is much more costly. Uh, so, itself. did you give us the budget allocation? For I'm going to give you the budget allocation oh, next. Right, okay. okay. So, the budget allocation is within the six hundred million pounds uh, budget. Uh, so, for the northern lot, it is uh, three hundred and eighty-four million. Uh, for the central lot, it's 83 million, and for the uh, uh, southern slot, it, uh, uh, lot, it is 133 million pounds. Now, uh, the budget provision for this, uh, in, in, as it stands at the present moment, because we're still in the procurement phase, will be largely fall into the next financial year, uh, because payment is made on a retrospective basis. So it will be the it will be the 20, uh, 20, 2021 budget where that will actually start to become apparent. Okay, so so what you're saying is, if I've got that right, is that you're going to have to find in the region of about 530 million over the next two years. Is that right to deliver it by 2021, or is the aim not to deliver it by 2021, as you, as you've stated? So the aim is still to try and deliver it within 2021 and part. Try or two. Uh, two. Uh, uh, however, I'm also conscious that when you are uh, when you're undertaking programmes that are uh, challenging, particularly in very, very remote areas, that there are can be issues that arise from that. But that's certainly uh, what the target is for us at the present time. The dialogue we're having with the industry is around what some of those challenges could look like um, and how they would manage some of those challenges within that particular time frame. And do you believe that the lots that you split them up, north, central and south, will all be uh, uh, actioned at the same time, or will it be a phased...? Um... No, they, they should all be... They're all out to procurement at the same so time. So they'll all be awarded at the same time? They, they'll all be you... awarded at the same time, yes, they will be. They could be, in, you know, as in it could be different companies that have got different lots, uh, but there are, would you call... Um, or it could be one company gets all three lots. Uh, the reason it was broken into those lots was to make sure there was greater competition, which uh, uh, would demonstrate, given the competition we've got for it, that appears to have worked. So I've heard the word try and aim. Confidence that you're going to deliver it by 2021? I I'm confident on the basis that, from what we're hearing from the industry, that is possible. But I'm also minded of the technological and some of the... Uh, uh, the engineering challenges which we're facing uh, around this. Uh, but that's certainly still the target. Sounds fairly caveated. And, and, and can you just confirm, when are the contracts being awarded? Is, it was February, wasn't it? And, and we're now being talked about early summer. I always get confused. Summer is a huge length of period. Where, and, and I am... It, it is in, in my part of the Scotland. The sun always shines. When, could you define when you think the contracts will be awarded? Well, let me just put it in context, is that some of the issues around time have been uh, as a result of the competitive dialogue which has been taking place with the, with the bidders who have asked for additional time uh, to work through some of the issues. Um, 
I'm conscious that the more time we give them, reasonable time we give them, the greater certainty and assurance we can have around their ability to be able to deliver some of the programme. So I'm content to allow them to have that additional time to, to carry out some of this uh, extra work and information that they require to come to make decisions. In terms of the summer, I would uh, uh, expect us to be in a position by uh, our summer recess, uh, if you like, uh, uh, to be in a position where we will have the contracts agreed. I guess summer in the Highlands starts earlier than our recess, but uh, Peter, you wanted to ask a question. Well, it was just to follow up a wee bit more. Isn't it the case, Government Secretary, that we are behind in this project, that we, we should have been further on than we are now? And therefore, my, my question, my concern is that we ain't going to reach R100 completion by the end of 2021, as, you know, the convener has already pushed you on. I mean, I feel that, that, that we're slipping behind and we won't achieve that target. Well, well, can I tell you what is the case? Is that we're having to pick up on something that the UK government should be doing. Uh, and their failure to do it has resulted in us having to step into this space to do it. Uh, and we're trying to do it, as you can see through the DSSB programme and the Audit Scotland report of that, and the fact that we've closed down the gap with the rest of the UK very significantly. But the reality is that when I've been asked about extra funding for things like ferries or I've been asked for other aspects of investment into, into transport is that a sizable amount of Scottish Government money is having to go into basically cover something that the UK Government hasn't been taking forward. And that's exactly what the DSSB programme has had to do and that's exactly what we're having to do with the R100 programme. So the reality is, even with the challenges around the time frame, this should have all been getting dealt with at a much more effective strategic level by the UK Government and their failure to do so has resulted in us having to step in to fill in their failure in this matter. Um, the final question, therefore, is to Jamie Green. Jamie. Thanks. And I'd like to keep this as a pragmatic question. Given that there is a uh, UK-wide USO which comes with its own associated contracts and tenders, um, how will the R100 contracts that you award, uh, with which will have different parameters, uh, sit alongside the, the, the rollout or delivery uh, of the USO, and I, I just want to see if there's any overlap, uh, any duplication of work, or indeed if it's being separated out, and that's more just from a pragmatic point of view. I'll ask Robbie to cover the technical aspect I mean, of that. Certainly we've had, kind of, right from the start, we've had ongoing engagement with Ofcom, and I think the intention behind that has been as far as we can to try and marry up the two processes, certainly in terms of, as a bare minimum, sharing as much information as we can as it becomes available around the reach of the R100 procurement. And I think, in particular, there's a real opportunity for us to work together to try and actually tie together the actual delivery of the USO conceivably with the delivery of any aligned interventions interventions that we might need to make um, to, to reach premises that, that won't be reached by the main procurement. There's got to be an opportunity there with the two, those two initiatives potentially focusing on the same set of premises to work together. And we've already had some really, really good discussions with Ofcom to look at the practicalities of how that could be managed now that there's a bit more certainty around the universal service provider. <coughs> so we're, we're continuing those conversations with Ofcom and we're hopeful we'll, we'll get a successful conclusion to them. And, but I mean, given that you already have contracts in place, or, or you've put out a tender for contracts, and I dare say the wording of those contracts will, will, already, be, will have already have been given some substantial thought. Um, as you say, will you have a situation where you have two competing companies working on the same premise, one delivering one speed and one trying to deliver another? It, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. So. Uh, can you just give more detail as to how that, that will be joined up? Well, in effect, w what we've agreed to do is as soon as we've got contracts in place that will obviously be at premise level, that will that will give us a, a clear sense that we'll, be, we'll share with Ofcom around which premises will get the minimum, minimum 30 megabits per second. That, at stroke, will rule them ineligible for the universal service obligation. As I say, from our point of view, that information sharing could conceivably be most fruitful when we have the premises that may not be covered by the initial procurement, and that then is the opportunity for some joint work, which, again, is just going back to my earlier point, could conceivably marry up a kind of USO approach with our early interventions. But, as I say, the practicalities of that are being, being worked through. But certainly we will, um, and we've already given the undertaking to, to Ofcom, that we'll, it'll be done on an open book basis as soon as the contracts are signed, that we'll share that kind of forward view on coverage, which will obviously influence the, the delivery of the USO in its scope. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And Cabinet Secretary, thank you and your team for uh, attending this session, which has extended a wee bit. So on the fact that it has, I would ask if you 
could quietly leave while we continue our meeting because we have other matters to discuss. Uh, therefore, for the committee, I'd like to move on to agenda item three, which is European Withdrawal Act notifications. There are, in fact, two uh, notifications, one on agriculture and one... Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the uh, officials and the Cabinet Secretary are leaving, uh, as well as us asking him uh, to do some things and get back to us on things, he did ask us if he would write to the UK government in relation to the R100 programme, in uh, relation to the derisory 20.90 or 99.3% to the R100 programme. So could the committee please undertake to write to the UK government to ask them why, given that they are responsible for digital connectivity, the amount that they're contributing is so low? I'm not actually sure that that's the job of the, the committee to, 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 to lobby people out, out with the Scottish Parliament. And I think, it's a matter, I, I think it's a matter that we need to discuss as a committee. And so, well, I'm happy to discuss it now and, if it necessary, put it to a vote. OK. I, I'm, I'm, yes, mm. Mr It's Rumbles. not for the Scottish Government to instruct the committee what the committee needs to do. I, no, no, I'm not saying they're instructed, but I said ask. We well, I'm not, I'm not inclined to take we instructions asked. from the government ministers to what the committee needs Hold on, needs hold, on to do. hold on, hold on. This is, this is exactly why we must, if we're going to do this and we're going to discuss this now, could I ask people just to do it reasonably and to make their points and not to talk over other people? Because I find it extremely difficult to hear three conversations at once. And for that, I apologise. But, but uh, John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Rumble is entirely right to say it's not for us to take direction, particularly in the circumstances where we are taking evidence like this. Nonetheless, we are scrutinising a budget and we've heard a very, to my mind, compelling case about a deficiency in an area that is indeed a reserved area. And I have to say it's a source of great frustration to me that these significant sums of money, which could be buying ferries, that could be building schools, whatever, are being used to this because of... And I think it's entirely reasonable to ask, uh, ask the UK government uh, for an update on this position, and particularly in relation to the overlap of some of these schemes. Uh, Richard. Yeah, well, we've heard this morning that uh, £600 million will be spent on this, and uh, the miserly money that's been given by the UK government, and continually it is the UK government who are responsible for digital connectivity in Scotland, not the Scottish Parliament. And we as a committee should be asking the, the UK, I'm sure uh, UK committees sometimes ask us things, that we should be asking why it's so miserly, the amount of money which has been given to uh, the Scottish Parliament in order to fulfil a UK um, um, responsibility. Jamie. Thank you, uh, Convener. I, I, I normally think we generally reflect on evidence uh, and discuss it in, in private, but if we're having it in public session, so be it. Um, the decision of the Scottish Government to implement a, an R100 project in, in its entirely within its rights to do so um, is, a, is indeed a political decision. There is already a UK-wide universal service obligation. Now, you could argue that the parameters of that are unacceptable to the Scottish Government, and again, they've made their views clear on that. But the money that's been referred to, that I think, as part of this budget scrutiny, is relative to the R100 project and does not include the monies that will be spent on an existing UK-wide universal service obligation, which is an, an, an additional uh, set of money that will be rolled out across the UK. So I think if you are looking at it in the terms of the context of the budget, um, I don't think the two, two matters are related. I don't think the, the, uh, the committee should be writing uh, to anyone on the, uh, uh, on, on the wishes of a minister, it's up for the committee uh, to choose to do so. And I think conflating the two issues is entirely uh, unhelpful. And I would recommend that we don't, as part of our budget scrutiny, uh, write on this matter. Mike. Yeah, we're discussing this now in, in when we don't normally do it this way. Our job, remember, is to scrutinise the Scottish budget. That's what we're here to do, and that's what this agenda, agenda item issue is. And I would rather be concentrated on what our job is and not what something else. And I think it would be totally wrong at this moment to proceed as I've suggested. So I suggest that we get back to the agenda, please. Mr. Um, just a few things. Um, one, it is 
th there is plenty of precedent for us communicating with the UK government. Remember, we had Michael Gove in front of us as a committee. And I think good cross-government working is something we would all wish to see. So that's just a general point. Uh, second point, the USO is not any money at all from government. It is actually an obligation on network providers. It's a universal service obligation that applies to them. It's about them spending their money. It's not about government money at all. So, but I think it is proper that we inquire in relation to an allocation of money that is in the Scottish Government's uh, budget proposals, uh, why they are having to spend the money. But I think our question to the UK government is a very simple one. It's, it's almost a one-sentence question. Is we would just ask them to provide the justification for the current proposed allocation to this programme. Because, of course, that is interacting with the Scottish budget. And I think that's the context in which we do it. I understand we're bouncing on the, you know, as Mr Rumbles has properly said, on the, on, the, on the edges of this, but it is a matter that affects the Scottish budget. And that's the basis on which I would suggest we do this. But, but like you, convener, I think I'm anxious to make progress on other agenda items. You know, I'm, I'm also very disappointed that we've gone down this route. I don't think this is the job of this committee at all. I would only add, to that is I, my understanding is that the UK government has already spent much more per head of population in Scotland than it has in England and Wales on digital connectivity. And I would rest my case there. Okay. I, I, well, uh, Maureen, entirely right, but perhaps before you press your proposal, you might listen to, to what, what I think may be a way forward. I think it's very difficult, and the committee always takes a position to leave politics at the door and to make sure that we consider matters as they are. I therefore think it would be entirely appropriate for the committee to write to the UK government to ask why they, why they have contributed that level and the justification for that. Once we have that, it would be entirely right for the committee then to consider that and to discuss whether they want to take any action at that. But to charge in at this stage as a committee and, and make comments, I think, on on, on information that we've heard. We need to have both sides of the story before we go forward. And can I make a suggestion to the committee that we should write to the UK government asking them why they have contributed that level and what, what, what reasons they made for doing that and, and then come back to it at a later stage as a committee. I'm happy with that. Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to, or revert to agenda item three, which is consideration of two SIs uh, to do, one with to do with agriculture and one to do with food and drink. We have received these two consent notifications into two UK SIs as detail on the agenda. As I said, these cover agriculture, food and drink, veterinary medicines and residues. All the instruments being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act. Both SIs are categorised as category B to the extent that the transition from an EU, EU to a UK framework would be a major and significant development. Can I ask for any comments? I'm looking around the table. Are there any comments? Uh, Richard, I think you just beat Stuart, but I'll <laughs> do you first and then Stuart. Well, um, the one thing I'd like to know, and maybe no one can answer this, is uh, whilst you know, we will likely agree to these, what happens if Brexit doesn't take place at the time and it's kicked down the road for a number of months. Do these, do these, uh, do these stay past or do, they, or do we have to revisit them? It's a logical question. I don't think we can say at this point, and, and it, it, it's somewhat hypothetical, Ms. Lowe, okay. but I've got it on the record Stuart. anyway. Thank you. Just, just to put on the record, uh, convener, um, that I think uh, we would wish to be kept updated with the Scottish Government in relation to the regulatory powers transferred by the Agriculture Transfers Functions EU Regulations 2019. Just a simple matter. So, therefore, are we agreed that we write to the Scottish Government to confirm uh, we are content for consent to the UK SIs referred to them and uh, note a request for a response from the Scottish Government on the wider policy matters identified within the papers. Agreed. Okay, that is agreed. The committee will now move into private session.